What is going on, everybody? It is Kev Boy, also known as Dos Zekis. It is your boy, Master Signified Bodies, aka Batai Dollar Sign. <laughs> and my co host, what was your name again? Rich Homie Lacan. <laughs> I think it would be pretty hubristic to try to give myself that moniker, but I'll go with it. Rich you homie Lacan. Lacan, you're you're deeper than I am. I'll be Bataille, but then that would mean <laughs> I've, you share you my life. <laughs> All right, so what are we talking about today? What what's the the two chapters we today got? Today we're talking about the symbolic order and then we'll move on to what are we moving on to what's yes, the creative function of speech the creative function of speech yes that's when everything is brought to a boil that yeah. we've been working with so far so I think, yeah i was gonna say i think to kind of um dive in let's like take a step back and rethink what was discussed in the last chapter with balance notion of primary love which at some point there are these things that he's like leading to to understand in a sense this intersubjectivity but then he takes like two steps back and ends up in this subject object relation with you know the uh modality of object relation theory um, that we all require the object of satisfaction without realizing that, you know, we're not talking about objects as the things, although that could apply as well with like fetish objects, you know, from a commodity to a religious object, but that there's always some mediation with that in that there is a recognition of the other. That's the intersubjective relationship and the symbolic aspect because there's speech that's mediated. Another thing is what this leads into is also a critique of balance because of the notion of perversion. And what perversion is a clinical structure, which Lacan will get into way later on in other seminars. However, this critiques the object relation because a pervert does not want an object in and of itself it rather wants the consensual recognition of the other while embodying for the most part, the law, the superego as like incarnating itself as superego with the recognition of the other and some sort of sadomasochistic relationship with some aspects. There could be aspects of fetishism, voyeurism, exhibitionism, et cetera, that scope, scope of philia, as you'll say, but Pretty much he lands on our boy Sartre, who's who gives a good analysis of the gaze and of recognition. Um, however, Sartre still as a phenomenologist doesn't understand the symbolic as well. Can you rewind a little bit and unpack what you said about the superego and how perversion is related to that i know that uh for lacan there is a connection of course between the kantian categorical imperative and mm -hmm. sad and there's a famous essay about it and it just it was very intriguing what you just said about how the superego somehow has something to do with perversion because that was a dimension of this chapter that i i, I missed entirely i forgot about the superego so it, it, if we look at like the the opposite end with neurotics, right? It's if they're enjoying not enough or they're enjoying too much and the superego is what prohibits them in some way or demands more. However, they don't really identify with it. Rather, it's the discourse of the unconscious. Now, with perversion and the way that Mikey from The Dangerous Maybe explained it was that Perversion is the exception of neurosis and psychosis and the fact that they're like on this weird tightrope where they could bounce between. They're not so much duped by the names of the fathers, but they have not foreclosed it. In fact, it is still there, but yet in some weird way that the, the their unconscious is structured is that they 
kind of align with it as if that's them. And of course, the law, the abstract tyrannical law of the superego needs to be, you know, actualized It's or instrumentalized by speech, um, by, you know, the symbolic order in which we are thrown into and interact. They take themselves to be the instrument of the symbolic in, in its purest form and in a sense demand the object of satisfaction within the others to obey that. And, and in a sense, it's like this crude way of understanding the master-slave dialectic in a sadomasochist way. Could you say that uh, in some sense, if we're going to attach this to the concept of the gaze, and we know that the gaze is what suddenly transforms you into an object as soon as it falls upon you, you become an object for yourself. In polymorphous perversity, you are your own source of libidinal enjoyment. And you are, as you put it, instrumentalized. You are self-instrumentalized as an object. Now, there are no objects, in my opinion, that aren't already symbolic in a sense. So there's, a, I think what Lacan is pointing out is that there is an, I don't want to say innate, but there is uh, an implied symbolic dimension to perversion, even at the polymorphous level, mm -hmm. and that in a sense, there is then the, as you're saying, the identification, a kind of direct identification with the superego? Yes, yeah, and, and, and when we, and as you're saying, like I agree with you 100%, like with the symbolic level, especially in polymorphous perversity, we needed to understand that if, if there is some symbolic significance to that, it's not at the level of speech, especially in, in, in you know, let's take the classical Freudian sense of the three essays of sexuality and all these like uh, stages of libido. It's again, retroactively going back to Lacan with um, what's it, uh, Little Dick that he wasn't an idiot. He had, he was a master at language, but he did not know speech or communication. In some senses, there could be, you know, an anchoring word that throws you already into the symbolic order. You know, we're already already throw, throwing language, but as soon as one word is put in the register of the symbolic, you're, it, it has to be, and I just want to say this because I don't want to go too far because we're going to talk about that in the other one, but, you know, a signifier or, or a sign is always going to be referential to other signs. It, it, there's no such thing as an abstract sign in itself or like a meta language. So with that being said, one word is already referential to the symbolic order. And maybe that word or just some sign in general is that master signifier. It has no choice but to referentiate itself to other signs. So total again to reiterate the total opposite of a Chomsky bro it's just like we acquire one word at a time and then yeah. at some point we create this totalized structure in which we could create an, an, an or uh abstract meaning you know no it's total opposite so is it safe to say that Lacan believes contrabalant that at the level of polymorphous perversity the subject is already in a sense initiated into the symbolic order but maybe and not everyone reaches this level of genital love which would be a neurotic neuroticization of the subject yeah like gen genital love is both i feel like a neuroticization uh, of libido and at the same time to like the fail to achieve it also is the aspect of feeling like you're not enjoying enough or like you didn't adhere to the symbolic order of the, the super ego right right but when I... we're talking about sexuality and then like the, the you know object satisfaction i think what like like because this is what like we get like these crude critiques and misunderstandings of, of freud is that he was like um super misogynist, uh, patriarchal and heterosexual, heteronormative. No, polymorphous perversity is the exact opposite. And in fact, it, you know, sexuality has nothing to do with even one gender or, um, you know, a, a reductionist to just uh, intercourse. 
Rather, it's just, again, how the bodies enjoy. And the fact that when we look at at least the social structures, heteronormativity aligns with the enjoyment of genital love. And in that voice chat that I was telling you the other day about like the way that if we look at D and G, they, they kind of like take polymorphous perversity and I guess you could say flip it on its head and make it more productive. And the fact that to deterritorialize the code of desire and libido in this production is to also decode aspects of genital love. Now I'm just kind of going on the hinge right here and finding new enjoyment, not in like being bisexual or being homosexual or whatever, but in ways that code for enjoyment, both productively, maybe in a sense, there's also sublimation, but in new creative flows, that's not put in the genital love, but it seems like the pinnacle of genital love is its aspect of lack. And this is the last thing I, I want to say right now about polymorphous perversity in in the context of the 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 super ego and the neurotic subject and genital love, but just to pull on that thread a little bit more, it seems as if Lacan might be more subversive than people take him for in that he refers to this uh, genital love as a kind of dubious achievement. And I think you posted a meme, or it wasn't a meme, it was just something from the Lacan Circle uh, IG the other day that said, a neurotic subject is one that has, or normal subject, neurotic, is mm -hmm. one that has overcome psychosis. I don't wanna bring psychosis into the discourse, but it's also sort of an overcoming of perversion. But as you know, our, our boy Brian Becker pointed out in his summary of the chapter that we read last week, he says that it is the repetition compulsion involved in polymorphous perversity that opens up a gap that allows the symbol to enter into the subject's reality. And I think this is what he wants to contrast his theory, Lacan's theory, from balance via mm -hmm. this path, which is that for balance, he gets the imaginary and symbolic confused in that the object itself becomes a pure source of enjoyment at the stage of primary love. And he's not able to easily, easily explain how this leap from that is affected this leap forward towards a intersubjective relationship which would be inexplicable and i think we talked about this last week it's the same as like the leap from culture to nature yeah and yeah this is where libido <laughs> enters into the scene and he doesn't have a good understanding of libido either which by the way i, I just occurred to me that we talk about the real in this seminar and it isn't as as brian becker also pointed out it it, it isn't as absent as people commonly assume here i would say that the real here is libido he doesn't use real as much as a register or or this libido. or this echoes of uh uh compulsive compulsive to or the compulsion to repeat he'll say this later on as well and it's just like well what he's talking about he'll talk about death drive right and seminar two he'll showed in the symbolic but if the symbolic is always breaking down you know what is the symbolic during the breakdown if death drive has this situation the symbolic well the breakdown of it is the point in which the real could be located and then you'll see how the real the unconscious repetition the drive they're all one and they repeat um i want to come kind of uh put a pause on this because i want to reference sure. this in the second uh chapter which will become more relevant let's uh, also just to add that that yeah. is an, again the notion of where real is in a sense kind of foreshadowed foresha exactly that's that's what i got from this and i, I want to highlight this and let's see if 
we can remember it because when we talk about hollow phrases later, he's going to say something very similar about these hollow phrases. And he says here, perversion is in fact to be placed in the limit of the register of recognition. That is what fixes it, stigmatizes it as such. But this idea of the register of recognition and the limit is something that he's really focused on. It this. makes me think of like, again, when you, when I talked about, or I gave a, like a little description of, of the clinical structure of perversion, like, again, there's the sadomasochist relationship, which pretty much is going to be predominant in this chapter and aligning it with the Kojevian Hegelian understanding of, of, of hair and connect uh, lordship and bondsman. But this register in which uh, of recognition, which is limited, what makes me think is the aspect of fetishism that's involved in that in creating this kind of mystification of one's gaze. Uh, like I said, there is this identification with the superego on the perverse subject, but if there's this sadomasochist relationship, the other for them has a limit of being the person to recognize me in my perverse act, not in a sense that I'm shameful because if I'm successful at it, there's no shame or guilt. But if I am not successful, then I realize in the act that I am a perverse subject or I'm guilty. I am a voyeurist, a peeping top, whatever the, you know, the dynamic. It doesn't have necessarily have to be sexual, but the fact that there is this dynamic of the master slave sadomasochist relationship, there's a fetishism of the gaze of the one to recognize me as the perverse mm -hmm. subject. And what about also the idea that you are deferring gratification in the perverse act, you're not achieving the realization of the of, of genital love, which in terms of just basic heteronormative heterosexual intercourse would just be like the orgasm essentially. Yeah. And that is the ultimate apex of the uh genital love's aim but it's sort of like here like perversion is always based on keeping the ultimate gratification at bay in a sense and like you're talking about it's more about the recognition but uh he says at some point here how it's also something um, the experience can sink into Shame, yes. Uh, from shame to prestige. It from makes me think to of heroism. Like, and it makes me think of like uh, point, somebody like, like. Oh, sorry, God, sorry. I oh. just want to say, kids, you you can see how it can lap perversion can lapse into shame, but at the same time, generally speaking, we think of the pervert as someone who is shameless. Yeah. Right? If they, their idea of success is to derive enjoyment from their perverse acts and well here's what i'm struggling with it's kind of like the the addressee of their acts is very important but to be seen fully nakedly mm -hmm. in their gaze though can create shame so how does the pervert get his enjoyment without fully being shame uh, sinking into shame i think that again what i was saying is like this there has to be like this one uh, a grandiose value of the other of, of the one to give the recognition and at the same time the one and again we're talking about the master slave dialectic the one that is the rec uh, to recognize the person the, the perverse has to be willing to submit right it's again this wager a risk, a risk of life and death, and maybe not even like physical death, but a, a, some type of maybe symbolic aspect of it. Um, maybe this kind of echoes the two deaths in, in uh, Seminar 7. Um, but it makes me think of like with this whole thing of prolonging the enjoyment, um, something like a Buffalo Bill in, uh, in Silence of the Lambs. Or like, you know, but we think of it like in... in yeah. In modern discourse, right, when we talk about like 
like serial killers who always want to refer to them as, oh, they're psychotic sociopaths. I think they're actually in the most grandiose perversion ever. And maybe there is some like, in a sense, like clinical narcissism, but with perversion as well, rather than the thing of like, oh, they're just psychotics. It's like, well, psychotics are mostly going to be the homeless people that you see on the street that just be talking to themselves. <laughs> exactly. They're not going to be the yeah. most uh capable people when it comes to like realizing yeah. scenarios and it seems to me that um another scene that's relevant here would be in blue velvet with dennis hopper and isabella rossellini where he's like abusing her hitting her basically raping her but it's a game that they play together and it's a hideous violent game but in a sense he has her consent throughout mm -hmm. but the one thing he doesn't want her to do is look at him so let's say don't look at me and then and uh, in this like in this sexual game that he's playing you see that he sort of goes through the like various voices and moments underpinning his life of of fear and lust and and hate and uh supplication and it's like this strange carousel of, mm -hmm. of emotions but the one thing he doesn't want is for her to look at him directly and that would mean that the, again that if that's the case then he th there is this like inversion to that where it's like now he doesn't become the instrument of the of the symbolic or the, the super ego because then that would breed guilt so he falls into like some sense of almost neuroses i was also thinking when you brought up that movie of, of something like um keeping it in, in in the realm of relations like just a dyad is mr and mrs smith there's a perversion right there because they're supposed to be what hitmen right and then like they're in a relationship and they're trying to kill each other and yet like they don't really do it but like they get enjoyment out of trying to attempt to kill one another and then when there's a stomach they're always having sex like that that is like a sadomasochist right there a sadomasochist relationship a master slave dialectic right or at least the conditions for it because it's like one of the other when we get into hegel and talking about the master slave dialectic that connect and pair is the fact that it's like there's this spark of a recognition which takes one's self consciousness as they believe themselves to be free outside of themselves in the senses where they lose their freedom and vice versa. And it's like they're on a plane of not necessarily like they're both equal, but they're both like at risk to being harmed of their individuality so it becomes this duel and yet none of them wants to die but then one will take a risk of willing to die if they could get the upper hand and so then one becomes the slave the other one becomes the master one does the labor for the master just to gain the continual recognition while the other one's deriving pure pleasure from them so then I guess it's the the notion of consent is very elastic here. We're not talking about consent as you learn on a college campus, of course. <laughs> but it's the kind of don't follow the pervert's guide to consent because the consent here has to do with the symbolic status of the uh, person on the receiving end of the perverse act we should we should follow the perverse guide to ideology <laughs> yes yes that maybe not there's still all right i i there's still some some mur murky murky interest spaces here that i'm trying to figure out but i'm not going to waste mm -hmm. our lovely audience but we should know that at least like when you scroll down is like the in in perversion is always like this uh 
again, what he says, the structure between the O, o and virtual O, the specular right. relationship. Yeah. I mean, you already mentioned it about like falling into shame or to prestige, buffoonery, heroism. They all these have to do with the virtual O, but it's like almost like this confusion of like the virtual O really being you. At least that's what my interpretation I took from it in the perverse. I the guess. virtual O is like always in relation with the super ego. Right, right, right. The super, yeah. right, the yeah. super ego as the. I don't want to confuse it with the name of the father, but it does have a resemblance to the name of the father in that it is this what the word made flesh that in some sense is dictated to you from on high. It is the or the one word in the case of is it Robert, the wolf child? Yeah. Who hangs on to this one word as his only life support in a sense to impose anything yeah. like any kind of um, uh, semblance of a symbolic order in his life and there is no symbolic order without the yeah. law so I, when I'm thinking in these examples of like the perverse act is it breaks down as soon as you and it's because it's very wobbly in that you can only embody the superego for so long without the superego being exported, yeah. exteriorized, and suddenly you're in the gaze of mm -hmm. the superego. Is that especially, right? Especially, especially like when you think about like with with the wolf child, it's like he he was like trying to, and I think maybe because he had the anchor of the word wolf that he was trying to go through these different phases of mirroring to go through that primary narcissism but it, it, you know it wasn't working and every time he would see his reflection he would hit it that's the sign of 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 the you know masochism aspect and then how he would strangle kids because i think of like comparing that these like experiences with him and and accounts with what is referred uh, by Lacan by the little girl and the act of marrying and the other child, she like hits the boy upside his head in, in another like sadomasochistic aspect. It's like, there's this like, almost like a deformation of a mirroring that doesn't create the full specular of them identifying with their body, but rather like purely captured by this like void of other where they have to like, destroy themselves from being i guess devoured but really what they're destroying is the other person or in this case he was destroying his reflection or destroying or, or trying to like strangle a kid so then perversion can also be a problem of identification I uh, like a miscarried identification in some sense hmm. yeah or like identification and, and enjoyment. Like there's no limit to enjoyment, I think. Well, in the sense that like to escape into the symbolic order is to limit one's enjoyment, that one's enjoyment itself has become too all consuming and too much, too much enjoyment in life can be uh, destructive, of course, and it can e even be alienating and 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 frightening, and one becomes easily disgusted with oneself having like overindulged in yeah. something, and it's like the pervert can't help but overenjoy because the limit, in a sense, isn't there. Maybe yeah, or and they and need to, or they are the limit, always imposing itself on their own enjoyment, and you can't be your own source of the law. Is the thing it has to come from outside of you. Yeah, that that's funny that you say because I'm thinking about the the perverse capital episode on Mission to Unconscious where uh, uh, Coop, Cooper one. Cooper uses the example of uh like the perversion of capitalism in the sense of like a sadomasochism for ourselves when we know that we don't have enough money, like we have to pay the rent. But we are like at a store and then we want to buy these new pair of headphones, even knowing the consequence that like, you know, uh, I won't, I'll barely be able to make 
the rent, you know, and pay the bills and I'll be eating off of ramen or some shit like that. But the enjoyment has more value than the practicality of neuroticizing your life by your bills and what you have to pay. You'd rather enjoy an excess um, and, and be the determining factor of, of the limits of enjoyment by that. And in a sense, hurt yourself in the process because you're symbolically tied to your financial status as, you know, living under capitalism. That was a great example. And I also want to point out what's said here that really backs up what you were talking about before, which is that, uh, you know, perverse perverse desire is only sustained by the annihilation, either of the desire of the other or of the desire of the subject. So it's also that the desire of the other becomes unbearable Mm -hmm. in perversion, whereas different forms of neurosis based on their specific coping strategies all are deny desire deny oneself the object of desire to make the desire of the other bearable if i understand it correctly whereas here you're the pervert is at war with the desire of the other in a sense yeah, and, and I mean, it, and it does depend. It's like maybe the other person could be perverse too, especially like in a, um, like some type of like, uh, I'm thinking of like what Brian, uh, the homie Brian Becker was saying, like somebody should do, uh, like in his video, somebody should do a, like a Lacanian analysis of the movie Fifty Shades of Grey. It's like, in some senses, is like even the slave could have a perversion of their own of being uh, a masochist. And in a sense, the what grounds it is the being duped that one is actually the sadist and the other one is actually the masochist. Well, in a sense, it's like they're both sh- sharing the same sadomasochist aspect. Yeah, they're both enabling one another. And yeah. there's more, again, consent involved in that relationship than it might appear on the surface. Two things. One, uh, you should read and maybe I probably won't remember, but I I should share it in the uh, description of the video. And an article by an author whose name escapes me called The Perverse Couple in the anthology I shared with you, the uh, cultural, looked at it a million times, but it's like- Lacan and cultural theory? Lacan and cultural theory, theory. yeah, yeah, but edited by Zizek. Yeah. Uh, there's a really great uh, essay called The Perverse Couple, which, um, you know, says that, like, the, yeah, these perverse partners tend to find each other mm-hmm. on the one hand. And uh, there was something else that I wanted to point out, but now it's escaping me. But I would say definitely check out that mm-hmm. article because it discusses exactly yeah, what you're the talking about. right there. It was the, the forgetting of the forgetting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yep we have to ask yourself why why did Alethea they... or no Lethe and Alethea Lethe is forgetting Alethea is the re- revelation of, of Heidegger sorry <laughs> ah okay yeah not, I'm not there yet but <laughs> so perverse desire finds its support in the ideal of an inanimate object I wonder why that is. Well, I mean, if there is support, it, it's, I would say that acts as some type of mediation, right? If I, I what's going to help around this is the, again, going back to what I mentioned with that perverse capital, an inanimate ideal object, a commodity, a, a, a fetishism. There's usually a fetishism. In some case, if there is not an an inanimate object, I would say that a pervert would manipulate to create one. Because it would theoretically lie outside of the intersubjective relationship and you wouldn't be subjected to. Yeah, I would say like at least in some way if like if we get into like a more aspect of, of 
if there's a if, if we're talking about the sadomasochist the master slave dialectic then maybe uh one would create an ideal inanimate object out of an animate object and and of uh, mapping the other's body of enjoyment right if you reduce the other the little other in this case yeah partner in your perverse act to the status of an object then you are not under the threat of being seen yourself as an object yeah which is what the gaze can do to a person just want to let everybody know we're talking about lacan and psychoanalysis we're not trying to amplify anybody's bdsm kink <laughs> and yet here you have an entire lexicon to draw <laughs> that's your thing some people are really turned on by verbal cues so yeah <laughs> in lacan you find a treasure trove yeah <laughs> if that's your thing but i think in general you'll probably just bore whoever you're with um, <laughs> it takes a it takes a special kind of perversion to be into lacan yes <laughs> <laughs> um but Oh, I remember what I was going to say. It's pretty much that uh, the master-slave dialectic or uh, the, was it Lord and Bondsman? Yeah. Or, bondsman. Or, yeah, Lord, Lordship and Bondsman or as... Um, Lordship and Bondsman. Todd McGowan said the original translation is hair and connect. That's some deep cut shit right there. Yeah. But the that in itself is a perverse relationship. Mm -hmm. So we're going to pick up that later and also what was said before about the limits of recognition i, I want to make sure we go back to that but yes i think we just gave a master class worthy explanation of perversion and the law and really well you can take the credit there of tying together all these threads because this is not easy stuff and it only no. gets a little bit harder but uh he all gets, we need to do is crack a couple pints and then here we go <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah i need so. several more after that uh, <laughs> so frustration is something that lacan talks about uh oftentimes in the context of the phallus and castration and as a lead up to castration but frustration, of course, always has to do with an object or a lack of an object. And I think it's, I get these confused a lot of the time, but uh, I think maybe a an imaginary lack of a symbolic object. Yes, yeah, exactly. Oh, and, so and you have like, the yeah. symbolic lack of a real object in female castration and, and if, the imaginary I mean, lack of a symbolic object. Yeah, so that's like getting into like the whole thing of, of sexuation but yeah let's not what, what, down that road. Uh, you are on the right track that there is in and this is again the symbolic order is always going to have some type of uh, structural lack or fragility and in a sense there is an imaginary relationship that enters in we could call that even the fantasy that fills that in and creates veils or in a sense I uh, use the word buffer zones, but as a protection layer from the real, because that's at least how he will describe fantasy as, as something that protects against the real in Seminar 11. But like, where is the real coming from? From the, the, the lack and the gaps of the symbolic order or the gaps between the unconscious and the ego. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and the frustration thing is like, again, yeah, it's, it's from the privation, or at least there is some relationship I think there's a, a huge distinction between frustration and privation. Um, I know he says it in seminar four. I don't remember off the top of my head, but yeah, like privation is obviously a lack of an object, but the frustration is like, I think comes from the fact that you desire, but you can never get it or, or being prohibited from it by, uh, I think the symbolic other that, always and maybe from the Oedipal complex is always threatening you with castration I think privation is the lack of an object which can give satisfaction it is a real object yeah. whereas like frustration is the lack of an object uh symbolically symbolically and then the castration is, is 
the lack of an object that just that doesn't exist and, and the acceptance thereof. Yeah. But I, I'm getting that confused. That's also in that anthology I, I shared with you. They talk about privation, frustration, and castration, and also yeah. a, a relation to the to the gaze. Mm, yeah. The, the gaze definitely uh subsists at the level of frustration i would say because castration is a kind of a acceptance almost of the fact that there is no one object that can ultimately replace castration this is something that not to get too uh, far uh, down this tangential path here but the, i think it's something that uh, Zizek talks about where it's like the thing you wouldn't want to give up in castration is cast the state of castration itself is what <laughs> yeah. is most at risk of being lost, which is a fascinating kind of concept. So it's like we want to get rid of everything, like everything in capitalism, but capitalism itself, you know, with all these uh, like crazy conspiratorial right wingers talking about corporatism and, you know, big pharma. It's like all the things that come from capitalism they want gone but of capitalism itself because it's part of the identity in which yeah. they have the referential point to criticize it or criticize the symptoms of it by being a symptom of it exactly even, yeah because they think that even, like even even outside of corporatism there's this autonomous agency in which you know they work hard they could accumulate capital and align themselves with the free market in some way and not be corporations <laughs> Even the stance of anti-capitalism, yeah. which I, I would consider myself an anti-capitalist for convenience's sake, but uh, even that stance is in itself a category of capitalism. And that's sort of an example of the logic of castration to me. Frustration has a naivete to it in that there is a belief, there's a genuine belief in the possibility of an object mm -hmm. that cannot exist and i think the the pervert also believes in the yeah. possibility of a real object of satisfaction and seems to be able to access it from the outside to the neurotic subject the pervert seems to have a privileged access to a specific object that gives it a status gives him them a satisfaction that can't be obtained by the neurotic who's afraid of their desire it, it makes me think of like in the cultural sense that like there's frustration that we can't all make six figures. Right. But you know, there's still, we need to, we need to have the other enjoying that for us to be able to one day enjoy that, or at least get enjoyment out of talking about them. And in the sense of like um, with perversion, it's like, there's this simulated perversion in commodified rap in hip hop in the music industry of, of identifying with the, uh, the, the, the one who has the phallus because he fucking he he did his duty of in a sense not only falling into the lines of capitalism by making music but also by being transgressive about it you know slanging dope trapping he's got all all the hoes etc and you know all his haters like there is a perversion right there because he's getting enjoyment about of the suffering of those who hate him those are ambivalent about him he loves that recognition Right. He and there's a shamelessness to it, and there's a, an inherent transgression, which is just the ultimate seal of approval yeah. on capitalism in a sense. And it can perpetuate a sort of master slave dynamic here, which is a limit example. Did you know that? I didn't, but now I know it's a limit example because. It only appears at the limit of our experience. And later he's going to explain how this is embodied in speech. Mm -hmm. And it, it's very confusing, but fascinating at the same time. What I like about this is how he talks about what ultimately grounds the relation between master and slave is work. It's not enough to just say, you're my slave and now I'm going to kill you. Mm -hmm. you keep the slave alive to serve yes so, yeah and the slave has to go to work mm -hmm. they're not a, they're not truly a slave they're just up until up until the point where they aren't working they're just like a captive in a sense yeah 
as in soon as sense. they start working, they become a slave, properly speaking. The recognition is put into use because the work is and the labor is always for the master. And and this is again, let's uh, uh quoting the the homie Brian, he said he he gives a uh contradistinction between Hegel's uh connecting here, even the Kojevian aspect, because with Kojev, the difference is not just recognition, it's desire, the negative. Desire is a negative, and we will desire the other's desire. So there's that aspect that fills in the gap for perversion. What Brian brings up is in the contradistinction is that of the Hobbesian Leviathan in which where everybody's in total war out to kill each other just for their own benefit. It's like, no, because nobody actually wants to kill anybody at all, like for their own sake. It's like, if there is, it's, it's usually for a recognition of a third party to see. They want the recognition. You know, a good serial killer, look at the, like, what was it, the, the Zodiac killer? It's like leaving all these clues and things. He wants to be recognized. I'm um, not going too far off that, but like bringing it back into like here, the the laborer needs to be recognized by the the master, and the master recognizes the uh, slave as fulfilling the desires. And it's even I think at some point this is where Marx takes it up too with the you know class struggle is that you know the sur in feudalism the serf is doing the work for the king and the king doesn't see themselves outside of you know being a king or they only see themselves being a king they don't see themselves as actually being dependent upon the serf because they're in that position of, of, of mastery but it's, it's right it's, yeah because okay so you have the real situation of being a master and slave in which intersubjectivity whether you like it or not still plays into it but in the ideal situation the point is that because the slave is satisfying the desire of the master fully, the master does not seek the slave's recognition because the slave's whole existence, their being allowed to live, derives solely from the master in an ideal situation. It doesn't turn out that way, but that's how it would be. It's kind of like that's the true successful perverse relationship because in no sense does the master's existence derive from being seen by the slave. The slave lacks a gaze. Yeah. And, 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 and to some sense, it's like what, what makes like, I guess, the Zizekian understanding of ideology. It's like at some point we want to believe that we're somehow like uh, we, our identities presuppose the material conditions and even ideology, but it's like what allows us to be able to critique ideology is being an ideology itself. You know, we, we think of ourselves as these, what he calls practical solipsists in which the uh, economic and material conditions, political climate have no effect on us or even determine us. But it's, it's literally our, our situatedness in that and that we could critique it mainly not out of just cynicism, but out of the disavowal of our fetishism for it. Because that's one thing that that perverts do is disavow a lot of times. They disavow their own. Right. Yeah. Right. That is the ultimate tactic of the pervert to, to mm -hmm. disavow. Mm -hmm what's wanted because if you are self instrumentalized then you're you're able to disavow the object of yeah life. and and it's usually thought that like at least like from the freud sense that it was the psychotics that that had disavow um in the process of like the huge um i don't know if it's verneinung or if it's ververfung ververfung is the the total rejection or repudiation but really, it's in the that of the um, the perverts because the psychotics are foreclosing. But in a sense, there is some type of like ver verifung verneinung that I don't know if somebody wants to drop in the comments, please do that. But what again, what makes like uh, perversion interesting is that it, it's always in this like weird relationship where it's not neurotic, but it's not psychotic. But yet, there's this huge aspect of disavowal that that they do 
to where they don't have to realize their perverse acts or the you know in their perverse structures I should say the structure of perversion allows them to disavow because if you embody the superego fully mm -hmm. in your mind then you never have to be an object for the other and you never have to experience yourself as the other yeah. in the other's gaze you can become mm -hmm. the source of the law or you could see the other as the, the big other that stands behind you and you are ultimately only the agent of its commandments. Yeah, it's like a way of like honestly justifying why they should enjoy to the fullest. Right, which is also the logic of totalitarianism as Zizek yeah. explains it is the same as the logic of perversion and it's sort of like with leninism and you see this i guess in a lot of marxist leninists it's like they are but the humble tools the mm -hmm. humble implements of a higher dialectical power this historical determining thrust of history of which we are merely the vessels. And that's sort of how I feel like, especially in, in Leninism, it's articulated, not that I'm any expert, but if it's supposed to happen all on its own, of its own momentum, we individuals are able to avail ourselves of this tool-like property that we have, which would help us to in some sense, deny our, our subjectivity. Hmm, that's pretty interesting. Which I is, think, yeah, I think deny our subjectivity is deny intersubjectivity. Yeah. That is, yeah, that is true. Let's see. So, and the last thing I want to say about the, the Hegelian myth here is that, yeah, it, the death is not structured like a pure structured like a, a risk or a stake this is something you pointed out what's at stake is the possibility of your death kind of makes you think of this idea of the omo soccer that who the the man who is in between life and death zizek talks about this someone who's legally dead a yeah. slave a being who's who's legally dead yes yeah, a symbolic yeah. death yeah yeah it has to do with the fact of like what's put at them is the, the symbolic stakes uh, of of dying, not of of a uh, biological death, of being signified as less, a less than nothing. Exactly, symbolic death is a very real thing. You know, it, it many, in many ways determines our anxieties. I wonder if you can see it like being canceled as symbolic death. Absolutely. Yeah. I think so. It, the, the horrific thing is you're not quite sure who your master is mm -hmm. in that situation. I guess it's just Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if we want to add anything here. He talks about numerical structure, three, four, I think what he, it, it's it's very interesting because I think what he's trying to get at is just something that like the fact that with Sartre there's too much emphasis on the intersubjective relationship, which is interesting because I think like I could be wrong, but Sartre kind of overcomes this pure phenomenological aspect for his uh work the critique of dialectical reason which he talks about like um fraternity groups and and, and other things it's like it's a multiplicity of, of agents um but like i think what lacan is trying to get at is like the it doesn't just go from like a, a third of like a mediation of speech but also like maybe like this threes and threes and fours could be the embeddedness of maybe the referential structure of the symbolic or maybe other subjects 
like the, the symbolic order always is going to multiply because of referentiality. But it always begins with a three. It's like even even with the intersubjective relationship, mm -hmm. the third term is always there from the start. I think this is what we were talking about earlier, which is that the symbolic, because there is no meta language, we can't imagine even we can't imagine the imaginary in its purest form. Yeah, and, and it makes it just like, the purest form would be the real. Yeah. That's and the it's thing. like it's never just like the, the third term is speech, but rather the master signifier that quilts speech. Right, right. Especially if we take into account the transference. Whatever that first symbolization is. Yeah. In the because I know in the case of the pervert, there's a first symbolization. Mm-hmm. And this is where it takes a strange turn, as will often happen with Lacan. Yeah. <laughs> talks about he's obsessed with elephants, hence my back background today. The and elephant man. <laughs> the elephant man. That's right. Yeah. So he this is where he starts talking about hollow phrases. And he points out something that should be said more often, which is any attempts to speculate on the origin of languages is bound to fail. It's yeah, like especially all these crude Darwinist words be like, oh, literally, or like anybody just like language is meaningless. You were just like gargling noises and stuff like that, as if like that's it, like a the perfect reduction. It's like it's just like useless sounds that we somehow derive meaning from. It's like we'll never know, know the origin of the symbolic. We could only do so in the symbolic. Like it's like a retroactivity, but we can never get at the source. Yeah, and it's like you Does might look, look at like a, a little child just learning to form words for the first time and they'll call a dog a, a bow wow mm -hmm. or uh, maybe a cat like a meow. But one yeah. thing Tom points out is that we can't say that a person has really mastered language, a child's mastered language until they're able to say, not the dog goes woof and the cow goes, or the cow, the cat, dog, cat, the interspace is cow, I guess. <laughs> the cat, the cat goes meow. It's like, it's when they say that the cat goes woof and the dog goes meow, that they're <laughs> able to use language in the truly adult sense yeah <laughs> that's when signification is possible to always to create new two meanings with, with signifiers pretty much to like attach incongruities yeah. mm -hmm. so he gets into this idea of like hollow phrases and he talks about the Fijians and this phrase they use, ma, mi, la, pa, ni, pa, ta, pa. Wonder if he got that right. Who knows? <laughs> but it's like, it's a specific situation that invites the use of this expression, which apparently is not their language even. It's like, if you were to ask them, what it mean what these specific phonemes mean they would say nothing but it indicates something and in this case it's two parties encountering each other who want a desired outcome to occur but neither wants to do it mm -hmm. wants to embark on the project so they say that in the hopes that the other person will We'll do that. We'll offer to realize this outcome in some sense. It like I think what he's trying to get at is like the understanding of like the symbolic aspect of the of the intergaze or like the master slave dialectic and that I guess it's like the the way that like a debt kind of carries out or an obligation 
a kind of like obligation to fulfill a demand. I don't know, like it was this. This was a kind of confusing aspect for me too, like on on here. Well, it it seems to indicate a specific situation, and you know, earlier in the seminar, he's talking about going from one slope yeah each to another i think that's what happens here too if i understand it correctly which I, I probably don't but it's indicative of a specific situation where two people are caught in a specular dual relationship and need that relationship the context itself to be acknowledged as such which is a different kind of speech than what we do when we're just shooting the shit. Yeah. Ideas, trying to make each other laugh, trying to pass the time, whatever. This is, some, this is language that's supposed to make something happen. That's what I got from this. It's almost like both parties are not willing to do something like, like if like all the employees just really don't want to work, but it like somebody comes to intervene to make that happen, which is the manager. <laughs> the manager in this case is just the phrase then I guess. But what's interesting, it's something that's defined at the limit, at the periphery, just yeah. like perversion has to do with a limit. Um, so it's interesting because he stops talking about perversion at this point. He doesn't really bring it up again, as far as I can recall, but what's interesting is that it has something to do with the limit. And I guess because we just got off the topic of the master-slave relationship, that dyadic determination is also involved in using hollow phrase. Now, I looked up what other hollow phrases are, and it's quite simple. It's just like when... A little child says, up for pick me up. Yeah. Or go eat. Even the word thanks, apparently. If you say thanks, it's a hollow phrase because you're saying, I am thanking you, but you say thanks. Yeah. Um, Maybe yeah. even saying like, yo, instead of saying like, hey, how are you? Right. I, I don't, but I don't know. That might be too general. I think that it, in this case they're like directives yeah yeah in, in a sense it's like it's performatives of, of a direction or like a demand and it's a performatives of a direction or demand and what's interesting about that is like we are very careful in how we articulate those performative performatives based on who we're talking to right because mm -hmm. that and he says pay attention to hollow phrases uh, in everyday usage because you'll see the kind of specular relation that's revealed in the usage of these hollow phrases and why we're careful not to use them with certain people because what it seems like you're ordering someone around possibly but again it's like that's where the specular relation comes into it because it's like master slave dialectic is somehow always at the limits of communication yeah and it, and hollow phrases especially if you if you maybe say the wrong thing that is a hollow phrase as an analyst which it could be the point where resistance is on the analyst that keeps you as a little other and um you know the even possibly of something of a counter transference mm. or maybe maybe not so much of the counter transference but what it does is it it gives more resistance back by the analyst's end it keeps something off of off of the the moment of of deformation towards full speech. You're saying it prevents it. Yeah, maybe like using these, that without access. realizing these hollow phrases. I think what that's why he's like wanting to know, like some of these could be like some points directives demands. Which, if that's the case, that is also an aspect of countertransference. Because then you're direct the, the analyst is directing the analyst in without realizing it. That's the part of countertransference in which the symbolic of the unconscious of the analyst gets displaced onto the analyst in. Yeah. 
maybe someone else in the comments could also elaborate on this. I mean, that's the, the one aspect I can think of, especially if this is a part of technique where he wants his, because he's training, at least in the seminar, he, he's talking to, besides Hippolyta philosopher, uh, other analysts. So this oh, it like, makes perfect sense. Yeah. I'm just wondering if there are other parts of the hollow phrase that I'm missing out on, because the example he's using there, I don't quite understand like what he's getting at. He, from the definite like i feel like i do but i might be missing something and it maybe it could be also if, if with hollow phrase well if if they're directives or at least in some cases they could be directives or demands or the fact that maybe other analysts prior to lacan weren't paying attention to these hollow phrases and weren't able to do the transference right because they were thinking that as far as balance that transference has to do with with the projection of emotions onto the intersubjective or the object plane when really no it could be these hollow phrases these, right these, because these it's, words they, they put they're putting all this emphasis a lot of ego psychologists are placing the emphasis on the affective relationship yeah when it's something as simple as using hollow phrases in a certain way that will conjure the uh, dynamics that will define, delimit the dynamics of a certain intersubjective symbolic relation that can set an entire kind of series of thoughts in motion, yeah. you know, thought in motion. Thought in motion. Shout out. Shout out to BB. <laughs> He's just getting shout outs left and right. No, I was about to say, I wonder if he knows like. <laughs> We're going to have to send him this video. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. So. We're getting a little tired of Balan over here, but he, he keeps <laughs> giving Balan. We give Brian Becker his props and Lacan still gives Balan his props. And Lacan's like uh, very, um, notoriously withering with his comments about different ego psychologists, but he's quite complimentary to Balan. You know, he's, 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 like, he's like one of those like people that are like, no, Ja Rule's got some good stuff. You should listen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, ja Rule does though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's a couple like, hits. <laughs> Like on the jaw rule, you know, that's exactly what he's saying. He's like, no, you gotta, you gotta listen. You haven't, you haven't listened carefully to uh, baby um, you know, first song. Um, real, yeah. <laughs> Wait, harmonizes with J Lo. Yeah. <laughs> um. So here he gets back onto the subject of transference. We haven't forgotten it. And he refers to one of balance examples, one of his metaphors about different symbols in British heraldry or whatever, yeah. and um, how the, they can be understood as sort of embodying yeah like evoking emotion emblemizing an emotion in some sense but i think lacan's kind of critical of this fairly yeah, like, elementary like he gets the symbols but then he doesn't really get to like the understanding of metaphor like there's just like uh, an affective right element, a purely affective psychological element to these symbols especially using the example of, of like the flag and, and the symbol of, like of the lion and, and all these things to to like you know British uh, British patriotism. It it's as if he wants to say, Lacan, and he'll elaborate on this more. But everything is metaphor. Mm -hmm. You can't distinguish mere, uh, what do they call it? like um, paratactical juxtapositions in and of themselves as metaphors, but not just everyday 
uh, enunciations about the world mm -hmm. as if those are just yeah it, it's almost just as bad it's almost just as bad as just like reducing down words to just like pure guttural sounds from you know physiology just vibratory and the, you know the vocal cords and then we just dress right, like, right you know oh appealing to it's just an emotional subjective taste to where it's like now it creates some some you know meaning symbolically just because of like a pure psychological individual emotion without taking into account the referential symbolic aspect of it which we're thrown in rather than then we just come to encounter and have this kind of aesthetic taste for right and it's there's always a thetic dimension to language mm -hmm. there's always metaphor involved in that between quilting the eye to a specific signifier something's always repressed something's always uh falls falls away and it's that falling away that allows meaning to occur because there's always an entire and he's going to get into this we don't have to get into it too long but there's an infinite regress of turtles all the way down of signifiers yeah. that back up other signifiers and it's like how is it possible well there is no ultimate explanation because we can't find that end to the chain where it's like oh that's the one that's the word that starts them all yeah although we can in the case of someone like the wolf child identify one word that does the job of all words or something yeah. in a sense um i like this thing he says about punching a table yeah as if it was really the table I'm punching, but he says Valent in using this example doesn't really understand metaphor. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think this is what he was talking about earlier in the seminar. I don't know if it was Anna Freud or if it was um, Margaret Little, but he talks about how so many of these analysts see the affective realm as existing somehow independently of the symbolic, and Lacan is very much against that. Yeah, Where yeah was affect, there's a there's a signifier. Yes. So this whole transference of emotions thing. And you hear and you hear about it all the time, you know. And this is one of the most predominant ideas in therapy culture is that there are these like emotions that just need to be felt. And what's the word processed? I'm Process. still processing. I need to process. And it's like, which is funny because you know, uh, case D and G. There's an element of machinery to that. <laughs> I think where these machines that process these emotions, but that ultimately analysis therapy is about clearing away all of the uh, weeds of ideas and, and thoughts that are clogging up your mind and getting to the pure emotion, which I think, uh, you know, Lacan derisively yeah. said is like, as if it were just a mere coloration, you yes. know? And that is what Valent is, is missing here. And, and another thing with the whole like uh, like the emotional plane and stuff like that, not only do you have to clear everything, but you also have to identify that some emotions and some words and thoughts are triggering and you need to identify those triggers and realize that that's something, a part of you where you need to set boundaries because it's it's a trigger toward, towards you and towards, you know, your own happiness and, and authentic self. <laughs> right. <laughs> As if well, like I would say, they're all trigger words. <laughs> yeah. Every word's a trigger word. Yeah. But what it triggers is other signifiers, which trigger other signifiers. And that's yeah. kind of horrific to imagine it. But <laughs> it's an extendo clip. <laughs> <laughs> an extendo clip of signification. <laughs> but banana clip on that. <laughs> you know, he said, 
again, the word inanimate has already made its appearance at the limit of the imaginary dialectic relation. So we're back into this idea of mm -hmm. the, the inanimate in some sense. I'm not exactly sure how it relates to the, the transference I think maybe in some sense what is inanimate is probably the sign until it it, it, it comes about or the symbol at least. Okay. So we'll use the symbol. I like how he says it's like even though Balan, you know, is is like a chump at like language and stuff like that, like he's not an idiot and he knows very well not to fall into counter transference. Like which he knows is enough. Yeah. To not do that like Anna Freud. Yeah. Kind of stupidly, clumsily fell into that. But our <laughs> and, and I think what it is 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 like the fact that we we talk about the affective plane. And one thing, like even if you're not an ego psychologist, CBT bro, mindfulness, simps, all this is like even in aspects of psychoanalysis, like the British tradition and even aspects in America, they stay on the affective plane on this way of being pragmatic about like, well, I'm only about whatever the patient gives me. In a sense, I think Lacan would be like that as, as well, being simple and, and seeing what the patient gives them. But at some point, the with these ego or these uh, crude psychoanalysts don't realize is that what they're doing is feeding into what the patient gives them rather than sitting back and observing and listening. And, and like, as Lacan says, don't get too excited. Right. Don't, right. Don't get yeah. too excited. Exactly. And, and they like want, because they're, they're not paying attention to hollow phrases, any repetition of fixation on words or whatever like that, or slips of the tongue that they, fall into the level of trying to feel too much on the affective plane and cater to that. And, right. and, Ballant, and Ballant is not like that. It, it like uh, Even though he, he writes about emotion, it's like at some point, and we'll give an example, he doesn't know what, what exactly the patient is, is, is free associating about or, or giving an interpretation about. He's unaware. Because in the next chapter, he's going to talk about the beyond of language and this assumed beyond of language and it's like most people assume the beyond of language to be pure affect but that's yeah. where you miss the, the forest for the trees now he tells here this story of a patient of balance who has this uh really uh, like long-winded tale that he tells him that doesn't make sense all of the details don't match up with one another mm -hmm. and then he's saying how balan at a certain point was like uh i don't know what you're talking about dog yeah. <laughs> like, i i really don't know and the guy's like all right cool you, you won analysis because yeah. you're the first person i've talked to who admits that they don't understand what I'm talking about when I, all I was trying to create was an imitation of an interesting sophisticated structure in my story so you're not faking the funk like everybody else that I've yeah. talked to up to this point now he said everybody else is capping but you bro <laughs> exactly yeah he he's not a capper <laughs> which is one another thing you can give balance is that he keeps it real but <laughs> then we get into a discussion of mendacious speech the lie and how the lie the instauration of the lie in reality is brought about by speech and the lie is very important for Lacan one I think because the patient could lie and will lie even if they're not you know chronic liars everyone lies from time to time, of course, but the lie is also essential to speech being speech. It hollows out reality is, is what I think he says. Yeah, hollows out its way into the real thanks to the, the, the dimension. Yeah. 
speech because and, there and, is no truth or falsity prior to speech that's what's fascinating exactly and, and even speech like the empty speech aspect in a sense is almost like a, a lie to towards the subject in question or at least like it could only help but say so much until it, it, it fails because that is not the subject in question the ego is not the subject in question the ego is mis is misrecognizing itself not to say that the misrecognition is a lie in a sense but i think what is the fact is like to be duped by your own ego and then you know associate it's like at some point there is almost like a liar like maybe even like the sartre in bad faith into believing that you're this you know specular image this, this kind of like seesaw of desire of narcissism primary narcissism and, and, and secondary narcissism which conceal the revelatory aspect of the unconscious the biaohong which is always revealing of a truth through the deformation of of the ego and it also has very consequential implications when it comes to ontology of course yeah. you know this is going to be this distinction is going to be big for for Zizek and Zupancic and a lot of other Lubanya school. Yeah. But yeah, I would say to go back to keep it simple to go back, it's like, yeah, like this the, the fact is that the patient could actually just give a flat out lie in the sense of like the example that we're giving. And wouldn't you agree that there is this aspect of lying in, in the sense of Freud in a female patient that like was trying to dupe him with like saying like, oh, I read your book on jokes. Um, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I remember that. And trying to incorporate it into what she delivered as an analysis. <laughs> and it's like in there, you know, the problem with the idea of lying is that we typically think of it as just like, oh, it's an untruth. You're saying something happened that didn't you're making something up um but there's an element of lying and twisting the truth right and but the truth is always twisted like what's mendacious in speech is the fact that it takes any form whatsoever and that's why the truth can only be ever half said because it has to take some form something needs to be omitted and the element of manipulation there it's like well did she read the book or not it doesn't really matter if she did i'm sure she read some of it and maybe uh, for the express purpose of incorporating it into her speech but right there's an element of of manipulation so it's also about it's also about leaving things out right it's about censorship it's about omission lying yeah. by omission is a form of lying um, maybe not in that example, but I'm just thinking of how when you like try to focus attention exclusively on 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 one detail at the expense of other details, for instance, there's something like lying involved. So there are degrees mm -hmm. to it. What else have we got here? This is what page two two nine. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, well, well, here we like well, based on what I was saying, apropos that, it's like you know, speech in its essence is ambiguous, and so long as you feel like you're the master of your speech, you're constantly tweaking and 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 uh, amplifying aspects of that ambiguity. In some sense, you're always orchestrating ambiguity mm -hmm. to to your to your benefit in some sense and it's like here i really like this example and it makes me think of i haven't seen this movie but uh, i would like to i think it's called a, a brief encounter of david lean and Zizek oh Kong. yeah <laughs> in, in, <laughs> like in 
<laughs> oh god that, that's hilarious uh the unforgivable dude do you remember that guy <laughs> yeah a lean night a lean oh, night. god that was so good yeah. a brief encounter in the bridge on the river quarry a lean night <laughs> Yeah, that was like so unexpected. It's like a lean night. <laughs> so good. That was a classic yeah. viral video. If you haven't seen that, look up Unforgivable. Uh, the birth of YouTube. That was a golden age. But we could never know what started YouTube, though. Like, you know, not the, the app YouTube, but like what started the symbolic order of YouTube. But we just know that that's like in a primordial. <laughs> no, I disagree. I think it was that very video. No, it's that there is the first YouTube video. It's that guy at the zoo. Oh, uh, it's, <laughs> it's like me at the zoo. It's called or something. And like, yeah. <laughs> got millions of views um so yeah i i mentioned brief encounter because it reminded me of the scene that uh Zizek actually talks about in uh perfect's guide to ideology not cinema i think i think it's ideology where this woman is just chatting away and he says it's uh, a very like um stock character in english films who just chatter away and I, I was just picturing this woman from the scene and like in the woman she's talking to in the scene you hear her internal monologue and she's like oh, i wish she would shut the fuck up but she doesn't she, 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 shut the fuck up but like i can picture who this woman is and <laughs> one who talk 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 to say nothing yeah. yeah everybody knows this person you don't have to be english to do this of course um people that just chatter away constantly and this is also let's say let's go so far as to say a form of like mendacious speech because it, it it has a goal it has a purpose and it's like the squid that sprays ink in yeah. its enemy's face <laughs> like distract it like to blind it it's like a form of blinding or in a sense like uh, paralyzing the person you're talking to yeah definitely and like there's just like that's could also be um the aspect of like even there's no transference in like narcissists like because they're just used to saying nothing but they're enjoying it themselves because they could just get talk talk without being interrupted and the the thing is it's that the chatterer in this case it's funny because the british call i think like the upper classes like that the, or is it the upper classes or just like middle class people the chattering classes mm, i'm not sure interesting. i need to look that up because I, I it's the yeah the chattering classes so mm -hmm. it you know um What's interesting here is we're talking about commitment in the world of labor, the slave who has to commit to their labor to be properly a slave, and then it becomes a symbolic relationship. Yeah. And only then. But the the chatterer doesn't have to, doesn't commit to any specific symbol. Because what happens here, what's in, interesting is that it's as if language itself becomes neutralized. It, it, be, it becomes uh, debilitated by the chatter to such an extent that no one word means anything that could actually have any impact yeah. in life itself. Yeah, and, and, yeah, it's like a form of Jewish science on, on top of that. And it's like there's uh, what we were saying earlier about how like you know there's never the effective playing without language. It's like there's really no like I wouldn't say there's really no, but it's like there's almost like an abysmal effectiveness towards that kind of just idle chatter. Like, there's really no affective emotion towards that person. They're just chatting away. Yeah. At least the only thing I can think is, well, jouissance is something in, on a affective plane as it is more of a, of a drive and, and the aim of satisfaction. But it would be towards oneself, especially from the person that's just talking, talking, talking. 
Uh, it, it's maybe the effective plane would emerge from the fact of them not allowed to enjoy. And then we have the speech of the child. And he talks about this also. Yeah. In, in the last chapter, we read uh, the element of idolification of the child, why they seem like gods at times because yeah, of the look way what my kids they say. <laughs> right. Do you hear what, and that they worship their little children for like, the like very parents reason. of kids who, who compete in spelling bees, like, my kid could spell this. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> or, or things even more perverted than spelling bees, you know. Yeah. Of course, we definitely fetishize children, especially in America. Yeah. Oh, look at those like beauty passions that like those Karen moms put their kids. Those in. are horrific. Yeah. I, I mean, the sexualization itself, just aside from that, it's just a strange narcissistic yeah. pageant, form of pageantry that goes on there. But like the idea that, you know, there's a, a revelation or something like deific in what the child is saying is another example of sort of the child doesn't even know that such a thing as commitment to the symbol is even possible mm -hmm. hence their use of what and that you could think the child could get into trouble if you you know if you happen to be a uh, a racist parent let's say and you use certain words around the house and then that child not knowing the meaning of that word definitely parrots you it can also get you in trouble right like yeah. that's the thing because they don't understand the impact of certain words of course because <laughs> that's hilarious well, not on the racist part but it made me think of like i think i watched dave Chappelle at a young age and uh, I was at the zoo for a field trip and I was with my mom and my grandma. My dad wasn't there at the time. He was working, but my grandma, my dad's side of the family and like, it smelled like skunk. And I was like, oh, it smells like weed over here. <laughs> <laughs> and, my, and the entire class and the teachers and the, the chaperones. And I just have like a glare from my grandma and my mom, like, you're not supposed, you're not supposed to know what that smells yeah, like. Yeah. That. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. What do what do you want to add to this before we Well, I think for the, for the most part it's like pretty much what we're getting at is this understanding of, of with with the transference does is is elicits like this the symbol of something that kind of when we're talking about it's going to disrupt the um obviously that the the one who's just constantly in idle chatter but this this weird experience in which there is this confusion between who who the patient is and and this like symbolized nostalgia of where they once were of enjoyment and that's the point of what the symbol kind of quilts for the transference that allows the patient to transfer onto the analyst. I think that's the last thing I want to add to that. And he's going to expand. Yeah. Upon that in the next. Yeah, and, and and it's the the importance of if the symbol as word rather than of just like on a pure plane of affect or emotion. It, and and I think like looking back at like the example of balance, homie, where he's just like, you know, you're you know like you're the first person that just actually said I don't know, like this feeling of of relief of not having to do, and to feel like, now like I'm indebted to you almost like you know, you know, you're somebody who like, uh, is, in, in the act of saying you don't know, no, your subject's supposed to know. <laughs> Good point. Like you need yeah. to prove yourself <laughs> in the, in your, in your, your candor. Yeah. And the, uh, the possibility that you would be willing 
to renounce the title that is assumed of you, yeah. which is the subject supposed to know. Here he talks about how there's this thought, again, this is what we've been talking about, of this beyond of language, whereas Lacan wants his analysts to remain on the surface to, to stick to the very like epidermis of mm -hmm. language rather than seeking the beyond of it it is found in the very dimension of speech itself yeah which is fascinating because you're still within speech when you believe you've gotten to a beyond of it what does that remind you of ideology right yeah, exactly uh, to transcend it <laughs> then you're, it, in a sense, you could think of a tra feeling like you've escaped ideology, that you're extra ideological as a yeah. form of, you know, counter transference in respect to, uh, in our society, capitalism. It's like how conspiracy theorists love to use the Matrix movie and believe that they could just escape. Right. Or like, I, I, I don't, I think it's called the straw man or something like that. But like this weird thing, it's like, you're a, uh, uh, a government corporation because of your uh, social security card and so your name on your social security card doesn't match any other paperwork that you sign so you could get you could literally like uh loophole the system by not identifying with any paperwork you sign therefore you could be a sovereign citizen you know by only matching with what your social security card corporate name says i don't know if you've ever heard of that conspiracy before no i haven't yeah I, I think it's like called the straw man. It's something. It, it's just this weird thing. It's like, oh, if everybody just realized, you know, the hacks of being a, a corporate entity, then they could be a sovereign citizen. But it's like, it doesn't make sense. It's like, well, then how do you operate if you're not already operating to capitalism, you know, with symbolic, well, not symbolic exchange, but like an exchange of commodities. If you have money and, you know, you're in this like material relationship, it's like you don't really transcend ideology in that way at all. <laughs> But the idea is that you would be uh, 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 quote, unquote, off, off yeah. the grid yeah. and yeah. fully autonomous in your own yeah. sphere of existence. Yeah, it's asinine. You're probably still going to eat cereal. Yeah. You're eating cereal. <laughs> You're an ideological <laughs> subject. I eat cereal. Exactly. Um, so... I think he's thoroughly clobbered balanced notion of primary love at this point while giving him his yeah, it, props. It brings up the mystic Angelus Cilicius. I, I like how Lacan will just, he is very democratic when it comes to his illusions. Yes. And he goes from like Michael Ballant to this guy, yeah, just to a mystic, <laughs> kind of poetically, I yeah. guess, epigrammatically cap off this chapter. He doesn't really add much through this example, I would yeah. say, but it's an interesting little. Actually, wait, there was something that I wanted to point out here. I really like how he talks about. The, the it was ego must be but all, but also like this um common misinterpretation crash crass crass spatialization crass spatialization it's hard to say uh as if you really just occupy the place of all of your unconscious drives yeah that's it can claim them as your own and sort of exist within them which would be more of like kind of a reichian notion of i don't know if i want to put it on reich but uh, yeah. like this idea to like uh, overcoming repression because doesn't yeah. have this notion of like overcoming sexual repression as being yeah maybe could be very reichian. Reichian. yeah very reichian it sounds more marcusian okay but, yeah I'm not sure if maybe yeah, Reich would probably fit into that, but definitely Marcuse. <laughs> so because he says that the progress of an analysis does not consist in the enlarging of the field of the ego, is not the re 
conquest by the ego of its margin of the yeah. unknown as if there's just this as if that's what the unconscious is it's just this margin of the unknown as of yet unclaimed that, by the ego. that is how jung imagines it too though is like it's not just repression but also a margin of the unknown in which you know there are fragments of the soul or the the psyche which would create the self when there's integration because the self is the archetype of integration of that which is unconscious to that which is conscious mm -hmm. thus strengthening the ego in this integration right it's for him the province of all sorts of occult mystical yeah ancient forces of which are in the subject yeah but, uh, what's the word you just used theurgy to bring the divine within you Here. yeah okay yeah sounds great very inspiring but unfortunately lacan's worldview is a little bit more pessimistic yeah definitely a little he doesn't want you to get too excited yeah and that's getting too a little too excited, but um, then then he uh, quotes uh, a uh, Angela Silesius's uh, track right here, this yeah. hot sixteen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, contingence and essence, man become essential. For when the world fails at last, the contingent falls away, but essence that stands fast. And I think what he's trying to get at is in the form of like this whole empty speech, that contingent aspect, once that fails, what the essence is the, the historic, historicity of the subject as it, you know, creates a history in the present, at least. And what's interesting, he says, like, when the contingent falls away, the accidental, the trauma, even the trauma is contingent. Mm hmm important but contingent mm -hmm. the historicity of the subject is more than the trauma i was talking to a friend recently about his therapy and he does trauma immersion therapy yeah i've heard of that stuff yeah and it's like um but it puts this focus on trauma so it makes trauma a master signifier yes and and that's how you see in a, like a lot of therapies you know, all the mo modalities. It's like at the core, there is trauma as it gives it like this substantial, like, yeah, you, like you said, master signifier, but it gives it like this, like, the pure causal agency, like this prime mover. Right. At the heart of everything is trauma and the constitution of the subject is which the well, trauma well, which, which is which is in a sense uh like caging them from accessing an original or originary moment of like yeah. birth into the symbolic which is an imaginary yeah. thought process well, we know is trauma is not a thing but it's rather the the grandiose fantasization of 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 the event, right? And it, the the imprint or the pragung is only something that can be constituted from what we call the primal fantasy, or even just the fact of the gap of of the split of subjectivity, is what allows the conditions for any sort of possible trauma to exist. Yeah, because this scene of trauma, of course, is this like theatricalization. The prolegomena to any future trauma right here, son, in, in split subjectivity. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think that about covers this chapter. I think we definitely need a break. Yeah. The next chapter is even more treacherous it is shorter but it's shorter but it's packed with guilt <laughs> definitely right we got we, we topped up our beers here and we are finally in the very last section of seminar one that's right yes speech in transference 
the chapter is. Uh, which one's that? Help me out with the Roman numerals. I know that. That's 19. Uh, 19. Yes. <laughs> that looks like a specular relationship right there, right? You got the X, got the plane mirror, the X on the other side. Just trying to save myself because I look stupid there, not knowing. 19. That's right. The creative function of speech. My my brethren, my sisterin, sister. we are almost through seminar one. We really are. <laughs> we made it this far. <laughs> and it is no coincidence that we're about to talk about Odysseus because this has been a veritable odyssey. Yes. Very odd to see that we came through this odyssey in one piece. Yes. <laughs> very good. Very good. Always <laughs> coming through with the hip-hop references <laughs> andrew flores master signified bodies he's going, dollar to sign. Be, <laughs> he's going to be the sherpa for this chapter because it's a tough one i'm feeling the sherpa. <laughs> he's gonna get us thing. up to the city of lhasa right to see yeah. the, the dalai lama himself and gain us <laughs> entrance into the symbolic the sultan realm of, of the forbidden city that's <laughs> right um all right so we got the good homie granoff makes another appearance here talking about an article that we probably don't feel like reading and uh, yeah it's, it, it's like one of those things that's like you shouldn't have this mentality like well, i don't gotta read so-and-so because so-and-so did this it's like you don't really have to read this because Lacan already reading it for all of us. <laughs> it's not good. You're right. It's not good to have that mentality, but you can selectively <laughs> apply it to different things because life <laughs> is short. Like just to rely on a truism there to justify yeah. <laughs> my laziness, but life is short and you just can't read everything. So we're going to let Granoff. I will disavow this. <laughs> I'll let the homie Granoff take his word for it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, chapeau <laughs> to Granov. <laughs> now, this is a very important chapter, though. Very, very important. A lot going on. Where do we want to pick the thread back up? Uh, this is like where we, without trying to repeat ourselves, like the critique of the effective plane also like is the fact that on some level there is the notion of ambivalence but it seems like what he's getting at as far as ambivalence being that you could both love and hate at the same time has some kind of symbolic structuration based on the fact that is expressed through language and where he's giving these examples of like various ways of denying i love him it is not me who loves him it is not him that i love i do not love him he hates me you know keeps going on but these are like expressions of ambivalences <clears throat> and of course we get like various accounts of like delusions jealousy etc these are all like things that are going to be like we should need, i don't want to use the word effective plan i want to use the term on the register of imaginary relationships however it seems like the notion of ambivalence has something that is structured by the symbolic in the way that it's expressed and that you get the hidden kernel dare i say hidden kernel of hate within a statement that has love you know or you, like to, to be kind of like stupid simple about it, it's like when the homies get together and they're all roasting each other right like saying the most ridicule things or like how Zizek says that every like other European likes to like say racist remarks towards one another that's their way of showing love <laughs> different Eastern European groups yeah especially <laughs> they really yeah they they shit on each other but it seems like what's at stake here is an ambiguity yeah an ambivalence in language itself that is that defines the 
inflections on the imaginary captation. And I think that at a certain point, it's as simple as, I mean, there's nothing simple about Lacan, but it's like, whereas we exalt the emotions, affects as the truth of ourselves, seems to me that at times Lacan saying that the change of uh, values here, that, that shifting around of various pieces in these statements <clears throat> syntactically is a feature of what we know is built into language and grammar and that language and grammar itself can change the way we feel about a certain situation. And it's as simple as rearranging mm -hmm. all of the different constituents within a statement to feel differently about the world around us. Mm -hmm. At least within the analytic session, it yeah. should be thought of that way because if we give too much strength and autonomy to affects, then we'll miss this very crucial dimension. Yeah, most definitely. Well put. Because I, I like what, you know, just like the fifth shout out to the homie Becker says, like when he quotes Lacan talking about inflections on the imaginary captation and inflections in language are modulation or yeah. modifications i should say i'm getting ahead of our, myself because he uses modulations but mo modifications on of different grammatical features essentially and that is symbolic structure Be beckers are are odysseus in this. <laughs> we, uh, which makes us pigs yeah. <laughs> we have been transformed into pigs <laughs> Thanks uh, to stultification. Yeah. <laughs> of just straight Lacanian, what have you. Yeah. Uh, so he's trying to get us out of these dead ends, right? Like Lacan doesn't want us to be traveling down the blind alleys that balance would take us, even if we like some of balance approaches but it's the impasses that analytic theory finds itself in today that as usual he's trying to pull us out of so how do we analyze language well it's never ending right as i mentioned earlier it's turtles all the way down it's signifiers all the way down you take the word main or i don't know mon i i don't know my french pronunciation yeah no no but i got the idea of like it's just like wordplay like um and like what what like or just like the root words how they could like connect with other words it it was very it made me reflect back to the um the lacan movie can't think of the name right there a du lacan that's yeah that's what it is where the patient is this uh Portuguese or well, she's from Brazil so she's not Portuguese as in like from Portugal so she immigrates to France and she's also from Turkish descent and I don't know the exact last name of like by heart of, of her father and her grandfathers but it had the root word rat in it and they used to call him a rat when, when he was in Brazil because of his Turkish descent. And then, so that be kind of comes like rejected, changed her last names, and she has a hallucination of a rat. And that's because of like how much like she has this ambivalence towards not only her father, but her grandfather, or just anybody from the Turkish, you know, kind of Brazilian sort of, lineage because she wants to be bourgeois she wants to be pure portuguese because she speaks the language but not well enough to a portuguese and she wants to be pure french because she lives in france and she wants to be of that lifestyle so like the hallucination is like the affirmation of what the unconscious is like and so that's why like thinking about how the way he's using all these 
words with man in it was reminiscent of that aspect of the term rat and seeing the hallucination of rat, which has an amalgamation of all these ways that it's used. And it comes down to the last name and the rejection of that heritage. Right. And the signifier has almost a mind of its own in the way it's able to glom on to other signifiers and yeah. find its weave its way through this syntactical forest of of different meanings and then generate different signifieds. And I, I know from having studied just a little bit of French that French is uniquely tricky in that the pronunciation and spelling of words, it's, let's say, almost like deliberately overdetermined in that like i don't know it's uh someone shared a meme the other day where they put these french words into google translate and had them spoken they all had the same pronunciation and of course it was like a nonsensical sentence about like yeah. something like that but it was like you know 16 words that all had the same pronunciation and all meant something differently so french <laughs> is especially full of uh time bomb so to yeah, speak yeah and wordplay and there there's this like word play. that's why yeah called universal language i think that's his name universal language but he's always making fun of french because they'll have like a same sound or word with the means different things like what you're saying it's just like overly determined out of all the lat latin like romantic languages like that's probably like the most over determined one <laughs> absolutely yeah. uh I say deliberately so because sometimes it feels like what did Creed what what did Creed say in um the office where it's like it's a conspiracy to like trick students or something like it's a conspiracy to <laughs> keep people away from their culture. That's my that's my theory. Uh, anyway, so we get into metaphor and he uh, sort of like once again resumes uh, this exploration of metaphor before we were talking about the different symbols of heraldry and how they would correspond to different emotions he's he, as a metaphor not like directly here he's talking about this phrase the the son of my heart mm -hmm. and how it would be an error think that what's in question is like a direct comparison and that like you know I feel like a Chomsky simp would be like oh well what does that mean well you just compare the qualities of the sun with the qualities of the human heart but already even within heart heart's already a metaphor so it's like we're already yeah. assuming the kind, not the actual organ, the beating organ of the heart, but the heart that is transcendent, comparing it to the sun, and then like, oh, the mind does this instant sort of synthesis of different qualities, and like what's produced is a sort of a frisson of pleasure. Yeah, like, not, not even a Jungian would even do what a Chomsky simp would do. <laughs> no, it's like... <laughs> No, no, nothing could be more that's like caveman logic right there Lacan not wanting to lead us down blind alleys is trying to say don't don't even embark on <laughs> that kind of analysis that form of breaking language down because you're bound to hit a wall immediately because yeah. it's all metaphor bro that's like what he seems yeah, to be it's just a metaphor. <laughs> but if this poetic metaphor has some sort of a special resonance for a subject you know it, it's because the signified that that comes with it mm -hmm. really mm, brings to the fore the quality of metaphor right I like mean, it's out the quality of metaphor is what is, i got from this this is literally what is 
it makes a lot more sense now that that we're putting into seminar one, but like what he's been, what he's built up in, in function and field, the notion of the signifier over the signified and how it's, you know, it, it is metaphoric. It, it's trying to relate itself through representation, through some type of image word, image voice, but it's never a literal thing, even Derrida's deconstruction can can tell you that like, there's no like literal language that we could have of, of like in anything of science and philosophy. It always resorts to metaphor. Even the notion of truth resorts to a metaphor. It's like, what is truth? Well, something that's like, you know, you could say it's literal, what it is, something that is not false and clear, clear, but also saying that it's not false. Like what it, you have to compare it to what it is not. Yeah. Right. And then what in metaphor. If there is such a thing as a pure information based statement, what would that even look like? Give me one statement that doesn't already involve yeah. something like metaphor, however banal it might be. And I think that's what Lacan's getting at here even in, even in like fundamentals and like electricity when it comes to like you know uh logic gates and like program controls or or like cybernetics there's always inputs and outputs but they have to be symbolized by a plus or minus or like in in gate logic it's like an and or 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 an and or not or it could be both false and true at the same time like whatever an indication is it's like well, even the term indication for like just the fact that a light turns on, indication is still some type of like metaphorization, in my opinion. Even the fact that like even the most technical STEM, like 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 sciences like STEM, have to resort to some type of metaphor to sustain their their models, or just to compare it to something else. Right, like uh, Schrodinger's cat, for example you know, like to explain that sort of quantum undecidability, you need like a fable mm -hmm. in some sense to, and you would think, well, doesn't it even do a disservice to the scientific or mathematical reality yeah. in question to even employ a fable or metaphor to explain something to the layman? And like, what purpose is that even serve it's like but well, we're still impelled to do it right yeah and it, and it's funny thinking about metaphor and, and the fact of stem when you look at engineers versus technicians um like for instance an engineer is, is somebody who's just like has a degree in in some type of engineering whether it be mechanical propulsion electrical you know they're not doing work they're just literally on some like good company job just to oversee the technicians are the ones that are like looking and, and fixing stuff. It's the difference between like somebody who's a chemist and created this cool cleaning formula versus one who's a janitor <laughs> using that cleaning product. And that's like, especially, I'm thinking of it like in the terms of like Navy, right? The, the technicians that are fixing things are always using metaphors to talk about like, especially with electricity, like how things work like, oh, this 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 uh dual relay right like the signal's not talking to bravo where alpha is doing all the talking and, and and the the receiver the slave relay is not and they'll use the term master slave especially on the ship which mm -hmm. is kind of funny uh like with our circuit cards it's like uh alpha master is not talking to to slave right there and slave is doing this excess uh, output on something that's not getting therefore it's giving false indication so there's a metaphor right there but when you look at like, my point is getting at, it's like when you look at like STEM, they're using all these, they think they're using all these literal jargon as if a model for a meta language, but there still has to be some type of metaphorization to withstand their model of some type of science. Even the fact of science as a discovery is a metaphor. And it's like, because as he says here, the emergence of the symbol creates a new order of being 
yeah. in the relations between men now you could get i think most people to admit that science does that but try to get someone to admit that the symbol does that yeah and, and the fact that like in the sense they think that they're trying to do something that transcends you know outside of the language but, but it, all of the disparate yeah. events of scientific discovery that they, they only the name science can uh, affect their arrangement as a certain genus of a practice in a sense like as or as species of a, the genus of science right it's like the practice of science whereas like if you got newton and you know let's use zizek to have a niels bohr together in a room to talk about what they did would they necessarily agree that their practices were the same yeah. or if uh let i don't know much about bohr but if he's an adherent to the scientific method uh or like really openly avows it and believes in it would he be able to convince newton that what he was doing was an exemplification of that it's like right and some might say well it doesn't matter because science is science but no science is not science yeah like 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 the, a sam harris bro would be like well science is always in the business of values and morals it's like oh. <laughs> i don't know he, he's like voldemort <laughs> he hurts. Um, <laughs> so this is the creative uh function of speech so it's like I think you have to think of it as like more of a so speech is something that's not uh, concave but convex. It's sticking out. Yes. It's trying to like go inwards to its core. You're caught in speech anyway. It's it's sim and and it's easy enough to understand that without yeah. studying Lacan. But and yet it has to be disavowed to speak authoritatively with some mastery about anything yeah and, and one thing i want to point out is like up till up until this these two chapters that we're focusing on speech was always on the plane of the phenomenological but yet he was alluding to the structural aspect of language now he's showing like how at speech there there is the level of signification and that of the operation of signifier, which is something that you can't necessarily disavow like as you would on a phenomenological plane or something that you could just take as purely immediate and forget about it. Even to an extent, it seems like for him, the hermeneutic phenomenologists really don't pay attention to this aspect. At least he'll say in like seminar 11 when he critiques like the um, hermeneutic uh, phenomenologists like uh, record but this aspect of the way the interplay of the sign is that mediates any intersubjective relationship that could create meaning and even the fact that signifiers right they always refer to other signification they have this metaphorization in the way that they could i guess relate to a signified the metaphor is that right because yeah. For, for Lacan, I don't know which seminar he expounds on this, but it's like you have metonymy and metaphor, and I'm a little bit in over my head in trying to explain. Seminar this. three. That's three? Okay, yeah. so there, that's where he also outlines the diachronic and synchronic aspects yeah. of that, and I think what metaphor is, is it diachronic or synchronic? Uh, I think... Well, I just know that diachronic just means that it, like the word could just take on different meanings over time throughout history. So maybe metaphor in the way that a signifier could be used in multiple ways is synchronic. But the fact that if it has a history where it's like the yeah. images is diachronic. I was going to say that it was synchronic because I'm pretty sure that's... And what I we could get into really here is diachronic though, especially with the, the, the Hegelian concept of the theme. But I, I just know that in his theory, what in him taking a page from Saussure, he has the uh, vertical and horizontal yeah. elements of language. And I think I think metaphor is horizontal and metonymy is 
uh, or yeah, I think metonymy is vertical. Yeah, definitely. That's the book um, I gotta read too. You know, it's the linguistics one. Yeah, it gets it gets really complicated, and I don't want to give any false information yeah. to our listeners, but I think that it's like metonymy happens in metonymy and metaphor happen in the unconscious i believe but i think that in everyday speech we're uh confined to metaphor mostly yeah. but it happens on its own because it's like the if you're going to understand the co combinatory of uh the unconscious you, you have to interpret that in terms of metonymy yeah and then from that comes metaphor but the thing is the unconscious doesn't i i feel like the unconscious doesn't need a quilting point because it's the unconscious. Correct me if I'm wrong with that. Like it doesn't rely on a ultimate quilting point in the way that like consciousness does. I would say like, it, as far as like the way I understand quilting point, it's, it is the unconscious signifier, but it, it becomes conscious in, in the way that it's actualized. And no, no. I mean like, in okay so w when i'm talking to you right now and trying to like understand what you're saying what i'm saying when i and in the very um every like everyday plain sense of the quilting point is just like the end of a sentence the yeah. point you the point at which you finish a sentence that retroactively changes the no, I know. Yeah. the eye I know. like that is something that pertains to the imaginary and conscious speech and uh, the conviction that communication is occurring in that yeah. dyadic mirroring way. And that doesn't, the, the unconscious doesn't rely on that kind of thing. Where, cause the quilting point is never, it's never real. That's the thing about the signified. You. If you're going to locate a signified, you're always going to come up with another signifier. That's the interesting thing. The uh, experience of something being signified is purely imaginary. Exactly. That's interesting. Because you could say, well, I re when I realized this, I realized this. I knew that I understood what was going on when this was said. When I reached the full stop, the period, boom, mm -hmm. sentence is finished. That's a mythical moment, though, is the yeah. thing. You can never truly identify it because what's frustrating is like if anyone really, this is why they killed Socrates essentially, because he wouldn't allow for a quilting point, really. Yeah. The quilting point is literally the end of the dialogue itself, where it's kind of like, all right, Socrates, I got to run. Like, and they literally like put him on trial and sentence him to death for doing this. And, but, and he wanted the death though, which is the funny thing. So it's like, was he really the quilting point? <laughs> it's like, yo, I need to quilt my point right yeah. now because I'm getting tired of this shit. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, no, but we can. We've got a nice like vacation home for you in Crete. Yeah, so we I can exile like, you. God. He was like, nah, I think I'll just drink this hemlock. It's like, all right, dog. I'm good. I'm chilling. <laughs> um, and then speaking of the greeks we get oh, into this, this us i like this little anecdote where it's uh i think it was uh cersei who transforms his crew into pigs, pigs yeah. and you know lacan asks the question like at what point can their grunts be said to be yeah. speech well it's at the point where they seek recognition where speech itself seeks recognition as speech yes pretty much and 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 the point is it's like not only is it the fact with these pigs that used to be his odysseus's men that they're seeking recognition but also the recognition at one point the nostalgic aspect that they were human so what i would get at is that there is this point in the transference and the creativeness of speech is that when the signifier I, I guess kind of transfers onto the analyst what happens in the analyst and simultaneously is this point where they recognize this moment of satisfaction and who they are were 
retroactively in some aspect of their life. Mm. I miss that dimension. Yeah. That's really interesting. There's a kind of twofold. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, and that's the meaning I'm trying to like, understand, like, why he would use this as, for, like, ex this example of, like, Odysseus and the, the pigs in so far as it pertains to technique. Well, I guess just to refine his definition of speech, in yeah. that, like, like, speech can be anything. It doesn't have to be words from a specific language. That it, it's not the words themselves yeah. that give the, that ratify the meaning of speech. It's the fact of speech seeking recognition of itself as speech. And it reminds me of something that I read in, in something from our boy Slavoj, the only person we shout out more than Brian Becker, I think, right now, yeah. is that and, uh, and the hook <laughs> and, and and Captain Captain Hook, our boy, um, the I right is like he says the I stands for the pure speech act itself, which is fascinating. You think, mm -hmm. well, the I is me. That's what it's at. It's like no, no, the I is the what is retroactively changed by the quilting point because something has to stand for the speech act itself, make the speech act itself stand out against a yeah. uh, certain background. In this case, the pig's grunt is not a grunt, but the grunt needs to be self-reflexive. The grunt needs to be, and, and like uh, knowing that having, I guess like reading the book, reading Homer, knowing his crew you can interpret what the grunts mean just based on the context yeah but he keeps you know and i think this is the kojevian hegelian legacy that he's influenced by which is that um this seeking of recognition yeah yeah and that's the main thing and and with hegel's recognition in kojev the recognition based upon the desire that's the difference because you don't really see desire wow. in, in hegel you know par excellence you see this in in kojev because you literally all the master slave dialectic is literally in the introduction of kojev's uh lectures on hegel that's literally the entire introduction because the, the fascinating thing is that like you can communicate desire purely through isolate, isolating the speech act and demanding recognition of it as such. Yeah. So like, it doesn't matter what information exists within the brackets of that speech act, but rather the fact that you bracketed it is, and that's what like jokes rely on. You know, <laughs> that's what, that like it's, essential to bonding with other people this is why i think certain like autistic people can't connect with others because like they they have a different relationship with speech and they aren't able to bracket speech yeah in the way it, it, that you need to to gain a certain kind of recognition the same thing with like uh I'm, I'm glad you brought that up but with like things like hollow phrases and stuff like that those implications and evocations they're not duped in the symbolic order in the sense that we would be as neurotics or like just yeah if, if one would call anybody normal it's the fact that you're just more neuroticized right right you know you're not i mean you are in a sense have some unconscious duping but you're always unconsciously duping yourself i guess that's what he would also say as far as like the mirrors the, the thing about the mirror concept is that it's not just a stage it's a phase that's constantly going you just think of it as like a phase rather than the stage you know it's not some developmental aspect well what's fascinating about that is that there are different degrees to what we're talking about here um with 
like I, what I want to call bracketing, but I know that has certain connotations in like a, with like who's role and stuff like that. But um, maybe bracketing isn't the right way to put it, but like setting in relief, the speech act in itself, you know, there are degrees of humor and sarcasm, for example. Yeah. And there are ways that um, people like signal who they are when meeting other people through humor like I know on dating apps for instance it's like a lot of women will say they're sarcastic yeah (laughs) I don't know ladies tell me on the other side of things what it looks like but like a lot of women will be like yeah I'm sarcastic and you know it's like that kind of sarcasm whatever it means it's like kind of saying don't trust appearances or I don't even know why I'm on this app (laughs) That, that in itself is like a paradoxical statement, right? <laughs> like, if you really break it down. You see, but even there, there is a statement that doesn't, like, it relies on the status of the enunciation itself. Yeah. You know, that's what's interesting. It's like, it's an, it's an enunciation that introduces a libidinal backdrop to what is being yeah. said. And exactly. it's like, you can pick up on that. Yeah. If you have a shot, you know. Like, <laughs> even then, you probably don't. <laughs> The thing is, it's like <laughs> degrees of irony. It's like what something that like <laughs> autists don't understand a lot of the time is like irony, right? Yeah. They they don't assume, and it it's funny because we're the sick ones. The the neurotic subjects are in some ways like seem like the most diseased, and that like why wouldn't you assume what someone's saying should be taken at face value? Yeah. But if you live, it's funny because then that now I don't want to get too off topic, but I feel like, you know, in a capitalist society, you have to constantly assume that nothing anyone says should be taken at face value. Face everything, value. Is, everything is a simulacrum. Yeah. <laughs> like there, it's all about like constantly actually like uh, keeping at bay the possibility of like any uh, direct communication with an organic world so it's like constant bracketing of removing the speech act from any kind of like yes but that is what the speech act is but hey i'm i'm pontificating no no that was that was good (laughs) uh so then we get into another of of the roster I'm listening right now. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Ego psychologists, Nunberg. And he's going to talk about the transference. Best part. And Lacan, of course, is not exactly down with his notion of the transference. I'm about to do what you just did. So... So this is page oh, 241, right? I can't hear you. All right. So now that we're talking about the transference, yeah, because he's uh, right here, he's uh, quoting an article for from Nunberg, Transference and Reality. Like this, this one was really interesting because um, it's right here that not only is there a critique of the fact that it's not necessarily just something on an affective plane, um, at least from what I'm understanding, but right here, it's even something in in speech. And this is where a little after this page, he'll quote like how transference could actually happen in the day residues of the dream, from the dream right, from from Freud's uh, interpretation of dreams. But transference doesn't necessarily happen from certain words being expressed in the analysts or, or from the analyst's hand that recognizes. Rather, it was what I was saying, that's something that kind of aligns with like the day residues somehow, not only are they, they, they creating this meaning that 
transfers onto the analyst, but it's this feeling of nostalgia pretty much. Cause I, I thought I'm not mistaken, this is where like his patient like had like this weird fantasy of like how when he was a kid, his mother would sit at the foot of the bed in her nightgown and just like kind of talk about her day. And, uh, you know, she'd kind of be braless. So like the outline of her breasts and everything was like out in the open. And there was this like erotic fantasy, but it was more mainly in the fact of like, he was the object of satisfaction and he could just feel the sat like just being satisfied in the moment of being uh, in total recognition. Something in the analytic session allowed that to happen where there was this kind of feeling of that moment in this symbolic confusion because he even notes that what makes this happen because the analyst wasn't at the foot of the bed like the mother in fact he was behind the couch type shit and you know he wasn't in this gown or anything like that he wasn't really saying anything like in particular that would seem off-putting in like the example given which i thought was pretty interesting i think It, it's easy to miss what I think Lacan is driving at here, though. First, he says something interesting here. You're not analyzing the subject if you say it in, but my dear chap, the feeling you have for me is only transference because too. once yeah, again, yeah. I feel like you're on the affective plane. Yes. That. That's a counter transference right there, just to say that. Just to say <laughs> that, right? Exactly. That, or, or like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe not a hollow phrase, but something of the. It's yeah. a directive and almost a, like a, yeah. subtly a directive. And then what he says here is that, um, well, I guess what's interesting is that the patient was already in the, or in his childhood, he had been in the habit of engaging in a, in something like a confessional yeah uh, conversation so he's very seemingly open to the analysis because it re uh, duplicates the dynamic of confession in yeah. a sense but i guess it, it seems odd that he points out the idea that well, well but uh the uh, uh, he's the analyst is behind him rather than at the foot of his bed but these are I think it's the same mm -hmm. thing as like when, when we're talking about the hollow phrase is that even the even the arrangement yeah the physical disposition of the people involved here affects the symbolic yeah. so so this uh, this is permanent. something interesting that uh I kind of forgot about but like reading it made me remember but like what donald carveth was saying is like the in the, the in the transference of course this is a neurotic transference or transference neuros one of them where it's a symbolic aspect in which he's not duped to think that oh he's literally my mother but there's this symbolized feeling like how i was when i was in this feeling of kind of uh, against the metaphor he's using is like in, in a constant confession. However, in uh, some aspects of transference, the symbol could be taken as literal where they actually confuse him for one's mother. And the same thing could happen in erotic transference and transference erotism. I think that's the latter one, I think that's right. But the point is that the erotic transference and the transfer of love is like there's a symbolization of like, even though I know you're my analyst and I wouldn't put any sort of like um, type of initiative to to like, you know, make any advances of love, et cetera. In the other aspect, there is this confusion of what's like, I am in love with you. I demand your love. Let's end the analysis right here and then and just let's get married type thing. Well, this is what Freud was talking about in the essay on narcissism, which is there are, there are subtle 
gradients of transference that need to be identified and dealt with yes in careful ways yeah especially in the last one where it's taken literal as in like like you know that that you believe your analyst to be your lover your true love that it could lead to like them stalking you and then like especially now we have social media them trying to find you on social media and all these other things and you know try to create tabs on you but here isn't he saying like uh, as usual don't get too excited and jump to the conclusion that oh okay there's a compulsion to repeat the analysand is uh you know um just simulating the relationship that he had with his mother and that's all well and good to identify that this reminds me of what i think he was saying about margaret little and the radio broadcast patient in that yes her interpretation is accurate yes you're right that there's a similarity here between the way you're talking to the patient and the patient's relationship to their mother but let's think about this and this is where the positioning mm -hmm. something as subtle as the positioning of the analysis comes into play and he says well it might be downright simple-minded to think about this but here's where the symbolic demand like that's the thing that's really interesting is the symbolic dimension it i think it's like when it comes to analysis everything freudian when you're talking about oedipus and all these things, it's like there's this drama to it that jung brings to a pitch of just like the the mythical the theatrical the you know archetypal and, and, and it's, really like, it's like this is it, like the all of the the symbolic consists in some of the most plain everyday trivial realities you could imagine yeah and it's not like oh you have this beautiful drama and then it lets you hear it. it's like rather you're here and then through you know the transference and everything that you're working through and historicizing the beautiful drama comes about the troglodyte, right? It's not like the Oedipal drama caused you to become neurotic. It, it it flies in the face, and this is why it's like, can psychoanalysis become science? You know, that's the question because it's not in like A necessarily leads to B and B necessarily leads to C. Rather, it's working backwards when the session starts, when the, the theme being named begins. You know that's when we start the session that's when or when the transference happens that's when we start the the session the more we could you know uh conceptualize the thing in the hegelian aspect the, you know the unconscious that's where we start to create like a, i will just say a line of flight but just the fact that we can work through and and, and historicize retroactively this eatable drama. That's how I see it, at least. It's not like from eatable drama forward, you're neurotic, and then, oh, now you're in analysis. It's like you're in analysis, but then you work backwards. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I, I know, uh, yeah, like DNG would definitely take issue with, with a lot of that <laughs> being anti Oedipus but it has its utility yeah you know and the nog troglokite if i'm saying that correctly part is very but yeah, and the troglokite is like it's not necessarily at least oedipus but the fact that like you're retroactively looking back you know from the analytic standpoint you know it's not to say that oh because of a it led you up like like the way like developmentalists cbt bros all that i think it's like oh the trauma started here and it led you up to here it's like no we realize the trauma ha actually really happens in the session when you actually start right, to right yeah 
The more right. you start to right. dissociate, the more you actually start to realize that there is a trauma. The trauma doesn't happen because it's forgotten and you forget about the forgetting. But really when you're in the session, that's when the trauma begins to become remembered. And that's where all these symptoms become, in a sense, overdetermined. And then you have to work through that retroactively. Well, it's like the it's within the session that the stage direction of the scene of your trauma, the mise-en-scene, yeah. really brought into play because if you think about it, most people don't want to relive traumatic moments and the, there's there aren't other contexts in society yeah. for the most part where you're made to relive traumatic moments, but it's the reliving of it where the scene itself is set where you become the the director and and this is it's really interesting thinking about it it's like what you're saying nobody wants to relive trauma right that's you consciously saying that that's you having self-reflection but then you have evolutionary psychologists evolutionists in general saying that stressful variables of any sort of nature makes you stronger this sort of thing flies in the face of that because it's not that the event happened and now that you're mentally ill but it's the fact that the more you historicize it in a way that creates a compulsion to repeat that right there is definitely a fly in the face of some any type of like evolutionary psychology evolutionism in itself of survival of the fittest but i think there was this guy named nietzsche and he said something like, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And uh, I live by that motto to this day. I'm not really into philosophy or any of that egghead stuff, but I think that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so we get uh, back to speech here. And I think this is what I was getting at before a little bit with like the speech act and, you know, intention, right? Um, there's what it, what it means. And behind what it means, there is, again, another intended meaning. And it's like, um, it's interesting because here you have uh, volor dire. Uh, yeah. And then in Italian, it's vol dire, which means to want to say, which I think is really interesting. The word to say, I'm uh, to mean is to want to say. You could say significare, which is to sig signify. Yeah. Or vol dire which is like, what does it want to say? As if the word itself wants to say something and, and could fail at what it wants yeah. to say in a sense. No, that's dope that you're playing on words with, with different languages because it's like, it's not only is it signifying, it wants to express. And that's what like, again, you're all about to hear our, our, our voice chats, but, but what I was saying about the, like if you could merge Jung and Freud with like archetypes and the complexes, when Freud or when 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 Lacan was saying that Jung confuses the imaginary with the symbolic since the archetypes are images, not structural linguistic signs. But yet, if there's this repetition of constantly creating complexes based off of an archetype, it's like obviously there must be also some type of symbolic thing that is not being named. It's trying to communicate, it's trying to speak something, even in the notion of the dream which that's where the archetypes manifest the most. Even in some sense, the, the desire of the other would structurally create itself in the dream as well, in condensation, displacement, whatever. That's it trying to speak something. So I kind of think of it in that way as well. A, a wanting to say. Yeah, wanting to say, a demand reminds, to say. Reminds me of something that I think Samuel Beckett said, which was like, how can I choose as a writer? How can I choose the right words so that that which, oh God, I want to get it right. That which I'm, say, I'm saying in vain can be said in vain. Rather than like, I want to say something not in vain. I want what I'm seeking to say in vain to be said in vain. <laughs> like, <laughs> And that's the the wanting to say that the the intention of meaning, the intending, 
you know, that frustration of like, there's an intention behind what you say. And like, <laughs> it's a very hazy concept Yeah. of concepts. This is where it gets really tricky, but also I feel like this is Lacan at, at his Hegelian best here. And he brings in Hegel who hits us with the concept is the time of the thing. Yeah. Whenever Lacan starts talking about time, I'll admit it, I instantly get confused. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is like that's what we were asking about the synchronic and diachronic. This is what we're talking about, the diachronic, like the the the, the time of the word. And right here, it's like things don't begin to exist until they're named. And what he's critiquing about is like anything of any what we're talking about, there's no like beyond a language, right? There's no pure affective plane. Even if we talk about libido, it's probably in this weird deadlock between the real and the imaginary, right? Um, before castration. But the fact is like, if you're already thrown into language, it, signification takes hold eventually. Right here, it's the the fact of the thing being what I think of as the symbol or the, the, the signifier of the unconscious begins at the fact of its conceptualization, just as in the fact of truth being the concept that takes its movement in time, which we will become subjectivity, become self-consciousness and the other for Hegel, because it exists in this movement of time. And for us, as far as analysts go, or like just like overall Lacanian theorists, the thing of, of the signifier really. So here's the thing is like, is like Freud says that the unconscious has no time, but because it's not even in time, it ra rather, or it knows no time, not that it doesn't have time. It knows no time and it's not in time rather the fact that the unconscious creates some time. And this is what makes me think of Seminar 11 because then the unconscious, which is the repetition of drive and the compulsion to repeat, will appear and disappear. It's temporal. It has this temporal dimension to it. That's what's interesting about Seminar 11 compared retroactively to Seminar 1 is that not only is there a time aspect to the, to the identification of the concept of the thing, and this difference, but also in Seminar 11, that the difference is that it disappears, it's absent, and then it reappears and it's present. And then once you catch it, it's gone. I that, think, yeah. That's something he discusses with Augustine in the next chapter, right? Yeah, or oh, uh, on naming things. Uh, kind of, yeah, he kind of does, yeah. The elocution simplification. So, but he calls what you're talking about identity indifference. In yeah. Why difference? That's my question. Because of time and and the I guess the diachronic aspect of the fact that I guess the signifier could 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 create more uh, I guess metaphors or or what do you say metonymy? Was it metonymy or metaphor? Well, I mean, we have both in the unconscious, but I think it's mostly just metaphor and consciousness. Yes, and the fact that the signifier could, it, it, the difference aspect happens in the fact that it is always dependent upon what it is compared to. But at the same time, there's always going to be the master signifier that we identify. I guess what makes it its identity is its primordial aspect its beginning but never what it is outside and here is why i think there's also this theological aspect because there's also a difference between beginning and creation itself in a sense it's like the world had a beginning right but it doesn't account for that the world was created the signifier had a beginning but it never really says that the signifier was created mm. That's good. Yeah. 
but it, it the diff against the difference is that it's always like in heel quote Heraclitus. It's like obviously the the famous Heraclitian aphorisms. You can't step in the same river twice. Well, you never really know the same signifier twice because it's always quoting on a metaphor, especially like. The homie Becker was saying with neurotics, they're always creating metaphors to kind of, I guess, find new enjoyment, but they never because the, the signifier seems to always be aligned with the super ego that always has prohibition. That's interesting. And the, the neurotics always creating new metaphors to like, find. Like, I feel like no matter what, every clinical structure is always creating metaphors, but in some sense, it always comes down to the level of jouissance that comes from it. And it's like with the neurotic, it's like it's never enough or it's always too much to where they're in this level of like, I'm guilty because I'm not enjoying enough or I'm guilty because I'm enjoying too much. Like there is this like sadomasochist aspect, especially like if you look at the PMC, like the, the professional managerial class, they always love to show how they're enjoying like, yeah, you know. I'm out here like like AOC. I'm out here on the yacht, you know, I'm with my husband, you know. I don't know if they're married, whether like they they married or like, you know, fiance, whatever. No, I'm out here eating uh, eating lunch right here at a cafe. And like how the conservatives are like, AOC is, you know, eating at this fancy cafe while her husband is wearing flip-flop sandals and these zoom on his feet or whatever. But the fact is like she's supposed to be neuroticized at the fact that she's enjoying too much. She should be joining less since she's a social democrat, right? Right, right, exactly. Yeah. But then, like, let's say she's enjoying too much, or or she's enjoying less, then you know she she's not up to par. Well, I'm using this as an example because it's like the neurotics like discourse is the fact it's like I'm enjoying too much or I'm enjoying too little. It, it's it's always a seesaw. It's never like perfect. They can never create a metaphor for that, like of enjoying their symptom. But then you got like the psychosis that's not duped. And then you got the perverse that's like taking it in their own hands. Well, and metaphor is always like lopsided. Yeah. In some sense, because something is a metaphor always uh, betrays a certain repression. Yeah. Yeah. And the, but the repression is endless in that it's like all of the signifiers. Yes, because there's no are... perfect repression though. Just like there's no, at least it, as far as before analysis, there's no perfect sublimation. And I think, I mean, that if, if what I'm saying has any kind of application, then it's like helping me understand repression because it's like repression is not just the repression of a, a finite yeah. content. But it's like crazy. it's a repression of something infinite in that sense. Because yeah, it's and it's always returning. Time. It's always returning. It it's always returning, mm. and new metaphors need to be endlessly established to constantly re affect. Yes, repression in some sense. Yes, right. Uh, well, here's where he talks about. The unconscious being located outside of time and it gets complicated because it, it's outside of time but it is in itself time and this this yeah it's generating the time is like what it at least what i understand it it's not like it's outside of time or that it knows no time rather that its conditions produce time and if you look at the um when he's like I think there is a reason why, like, not just because he's being Lacan that he's quoting freaking Angelus Celestius is the fact of, like, even when contingency is taken away, essence stands fast. Even if you could take away the contingency of not time, but, but the historical aspect of time, which is material, the signifier does stand fast. Hmm. But the signifier also has to function. It's not outside of language or of the material matters. It definitely has a play. But like, this is like a negative dialectic 
of going back to the primordial scene just to retroactively just to go back forward, right? Going back to the primordial scene. Yeah, just to only go back forward, just to, to see like, now this is you now, right? You go right. back first, then you go forward rather than going forward and then look, <laughs> looking back type thing. But even yeah. if there is a looking back in, in, in evolutionary ways. You know. It's kind of a, it's a violation of our chronological time commitments. Yeah. In that Charlie Pride is a definitely interesting concept. You can make a whole like, so. what what's interesting to me, what comes to mind is the faces in the curtains. Remember that? Mm, yes. It, like it, socialized time, I think is what he calls it. And it's like you have this because we still think of we think of time as clock time. If someone's gonna ask us what time is. Yeah we generally would respond with clock time but what really marks the moments of our lives or our understanding of time of course yeah. it's subjective it's colored by specific moments and incidents which this is the forgetting of the forgetting because these moments exist but it's like a tree falls in the forest kind of thing because it's like if i don't recall a traumatic moment and if i don't elaborate on the details of that traumatic moment which as we discussed are only ever really explored yeah. and ultimately embellished within the context of the analytic session then they exist but they don't exist it's like it's a strange yeah. thing because it's like the scene itself doesn't exist until i put it into signifiers until i attach signifiers to it but somehow these time markers are there and that's I mean, the paradox of it. You're familiar with, with Heidegger's notion of time, right? So like, at least to an extent, it's like the same thing that Heidegger says, right? It's like in different civilizations, you have different notions of, of how time is measured. And it's only in our modernity of time and how it always gets faster and faster because of the digital age that there's this concealment and dislocation with the everydayness we're too absorbed that it's dislocating rather than in like ancient societies the sundial or the hourglass whatever or even in super mayan tribal whatever you want to call it um using the celestial nodes of the sun and the moon as aspects of you know measuring time right there's a different way of consciousness of moving and then now you have this and it's like we're just so and then when we stop we're just like what the hell like we don't know how to cover our ground in these spaces of movement and when it comes to the signifier or that which is being conceptualized as a thing it's like it's not in its movement but when you reflectively go back that then the signifier has importance right especially well, if the sign if, if there's a, a a repetition in this in the signifier if there's also a break because signification always has weak points because the weak points represent the location of the real but <clears throat> what you were just talking about is something that I was confused by, which is like this kind of modulation. So we know that the unconscious exists outside of time, but the unconscious is what uh, introduces or structures our um, understanding of time symbolically in terms of like generating these markers, let's say, yeah. which would be explored in the analysis but uh what is this like certain modulation that's what makes me think that he's talking about some type of drive of the real or or of course death drive in the real but like a certain modulation makes me think of an indication of something repetitive something of the real something of drive 
the term modulation is always something that is usually usually yeah, like a form of controlling yeah. or of an indication, but no matter what, it's always repetitive. That's what I think of modulation as like something of a control mechanism, but it's always moving. It's always always operating. It could be drive. But the, the right here, the compulsion to repeat involves compulsion to repeat. Yeah. So it's the compulsion to repeat that is able to attach a thing to I'm calling it a time marker for yeah, now. Yeah, because a module to me represents like a controlling structure that is always like a in a sense like a prime mover or something that at least has control. Some type of yeah, like movement or direction of movement. But so you have the concept, you have the compulsion to repeat, and you have time. How I just want to linger on this just to make sure that it's signified for me. Like, yeah. how do those three combine? Then? Yeah, and so that's the thing. It's just like it seems like, and I have to always go back to seminar eleven because in seminar eleven. He's always saying, or he says in the first two chapters that the unconscious, right, has this temporal logic to it where not only is it a compulsory repetition, but in time, it's always coming back and repeating. It's, it's, it, it comes through and then it disappears. Like, it's never like a steady step thing in the unconscious. Rather, the unconscious, if it is this compulsory death drive that comes and goes it has this weird time span to it, this weird cyclical loop, not like a linear time of past, present, future, but rather this constant like cycle, cyclical loop, cyclical dimension to it. But it reproduces the thing within yeah. the cyclical action. Yeah. And provides the material support for for the signifier or like yeah, yeah i would say yeah for the signifier yeah hmm still very confusing dude. i'm not gonna <laughs> yeah, lie. Yeah. Like, i am not gonna lie and say like oh yeah it makes sense it's that <laughs> it's definitely it's definitely jargon i guess it's like, like, i'm I... comparing it to seminar 11 because i feel like a lot of seminar 11 is an elaborated even a repetition of seminar one but with better emphasis on the real compared to this one. So, okay, this is my attempt to break it down because I know that like the word for drive in French is pulsion, right? Like pul like a pulsion, like a pulse, right? It's a pulsation, which is like, I actually, we were talking about Chiesa earlier. I think it's like what Chiesa uh, strives Ooh. to specify uh, to, in, in his, retort to yeah uh, Zizek, which is that it's more like a pulsation we can't like the drive it should be thought of so much as movement as pulsation in a sense which kind of does make sense to me if, if it's this pulsating libidinal reality yeah that underlies everything then the it's like a or like a metronome that's yeah. like constantly moving at a regular speed then our sense of time is only the time of drive and yes. the time of its pulsation now the symbol as a name as you mentioned before is the beginning of an object the beginning of a concept which presumably has an end too how could we mark the beginning of a concept, if not via the pulsation of drive. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like this, again, the symbol does get associated with drive in the next lecture, in which the later we get into Lacan, okay. the, the symbol becomes <laughs> not associated with the drive, but rather drive is the repetition of the real. <laughs> And that the symbol fails to to structure itself, and in that failure, the real appears. <laughs> mm, okay, yeah, because yeah. I, I I have to remember that also, 
Lacan makes these statements and he never really wraps things up. So yeah, I, I think, I, I mean, it's probably because I'm dumb, but I think there's like- It's really just because it's like he leaves a lot open, right? Yeah, there's you some- know, uh, you're, not, hands. you're not duped by seminar one because you're used to the other seminars that are referenced by- Zizek and other Lacanian theorists that are used to reading like seminar 11 and up they're not used to reading like seminar one through nine mm. or one through ten I should say good point yeah you know and if they read anything between those numbers it's always five the graphics of desire right yeah we're yeah. like um the two guys watching you know like Tarantino student films or whatever yeah like, I don't think he went to college but like you know what I mean like it's like th this is not yeah this is a very neglected seminar but i think important um They're watching all tarantino's films without the foot fetish aspect to it <laughs> <laughs> can you can one now that i know that's a thing can i even see the movies that's a natroglodyte <laughs> right right it changes everything i feel <laughs> as movies um well all right uh almost almost finished guys Let's see. So he brings it back to speech. We have to analyze speech in stages, see yeah. multiple meanings between the lines in accordance with like this compulsion to repeat, but this um, this modulation of meanings, which is always generating other meanings. Is there no end to it? He says. No, it is not without end. So there you go. That's the big, in a sense, there's no end to analysis yeah. in that way. Other well, than, and, yeah, and the yeah. thing is, it's like, maybe not for the analyst end, but there's no end to analysis for the analysts themselves because they are analyst ends. They're always under supervision as they're doing analysis. Because yeah. so the line, they're going to have death drive of some sort. They're going to have some jouissance. In some senses, it's like, Maybe they don't realize it, but neither do like like let's say they get the most perverse subject ever. It could traumatize them in the stories that they tell that they yeah become neurotic, or in the fact that they become so perverse because they're used to feeling like they're the master because they have people that are just like giving them this recognition. Of, well. It's yeah. interesting because in the as the Acid Horizon episodes, listening with McGowan and and Angley and the 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 uh, no sorry it was um uh Mashiach uh, Unconscious those guys they were yeah. talking about yeah Lacan and, and Guattari and like uh, Taylor you know, Atkins and, and Cooper Cherry you know, Taylor Atkins and Cooper Cherry and like how um you know McGowan was like yeah like Lacan was definitely perverse yeah. You know, if there's a psychic structure that applies to him and his writing and like the way he treated certain people, yeah, definite perversion, you know, yeah. and it's like maybe you maybe you'd have to be to be uh, that much of a genius, but like, you know, to 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 analyze that many people to dedicate your life to it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Present company. Yeah. Excluded. You would definitely need it. No, like all analysts need another an, uh, or another analyst and be the analyst and that's what helps them go through because especially like dealing with the unconscious is no joke whether you're a freudian lacanian object relations jungian kleinian kahootian whatever the fuck you're dealing with somebody's unconscious even if you're unaware of the language aspect like even balance in this motherfucker is right here just like you know i don't know what you mean it's like this motherfucker was just untouched. Like he literally 50 cent bulletproof, <laughs> but not everybody <laughs> could be like him. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> not everybody could be like many men. <laughs> That's a good song. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just the fact it's like with that aspect, like, and yeah, Lacan probably had some perversion, maybe not in the analytic session, but in his writing, definitely, which was what Todd McGowan says, like his writing had some perversion to it. Absolutely. If you've ever tried to read it, he <laughs> his perversion and his sadism definitely yeah. comes through in his yeah. writing. Because it is <laughs> not easy to read and it is intentionally like that. 
Maybe that's why he also said that there was a uh, a relation between the Khan and and Saad. It's the fact that Khan's right is also perverse. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I, I don't think he was Khan was trying to be willingly perverse, though. I think yeah. <laughs> the way he lived his life more so. Yeah. <laughs> perverse in terms of the absolute uh, faithfulness or <laughs> his loyalty to the compulsion to repeat. Yeah, <laughs> influence the way he wrote. Uh, so if ever there was a pervert, yeah, it was definitely Kant. Uh, let's okay, we're we're about to wrap up. Let's make sure we don't miss anything important here. Um, because I I get so caught up in the uh, the philosophical implications of the concept being the time of the thing that I I don't want to miss what he's saying here, mm -hmm. the specular relation, placing speech in a kind of suspension, in relation to what amounts of purely imaginary situation. Uh, what are we dealing with here? So right here, this is where he's bringing up his empty speech, full speech of a. Uh the uh function and fields and then like this is where i wanted to bring back the whole thing of the day residues in which the day residues right there are memory traces of the everyday events but somehow they get forgotten but they tie into meaning they tie into the unconscious in a certain way in which they latch on to create signification and that's the whole thing about the presence of full speech is that it only comes about in the deformation of the ego in which empty speech is the mediation, right? Wait, so we're about to talk about, okay, so in this- Yeah, part, we're talking about transference. And in the first time that Freud brings up transference, which is not in the Dora essay, but U Uber Tragung, the transference, is brought up in Traum de Tung, the dream work the interpretation of dreams in which he talks about the aspect of day residues that in our everyday life and this is also something to be that like that builds up with not only what i was talking about earlier about the, like the difference between like cbt and ego psychology evolutionary shit and the chocolate kite but also in the fact it's like there's this like weird fixation in modern therapy to overly emphasize the childhood and overly emphasize the family as trauma, which is so weird because they want to dismiss Freud and say that he's a quack doctor, but yet they overly emphasize the child family relationship more than him. More than Freud, right. More than Freud. Freud yeah, in, that's fascinating the a to b to c aspect where it's him he's in this nitroglycite aspect of retroactivity of building backwards but in these day residues the fact that it's like saying that meaning and trauma could happen as you exist right now trauma never existed back then it could only exist now as it's formulated in your dreams as it's formulated from aspects of your day residue in the pre-conscious and how it quilts meaning with whatever the signifier is in your mind or in your unconscious, right? It it, it creates this meaning with the day residues. This might be an aside, but you just made me think of how given people's perceptions of therapy and Freud and the sort of like uh, parodic uh, take on Freud as you know you, you want to have sex with your mother or yeah it's something that happened in your your childhood your childhood always like this emphasis on that people come to analysis today expecting that yeah or trying to get ahead of that in some sense anticipating it either like trying to undermine that discourse or lean into it in a way that's counterproductive and you know, it's funny that you mentioned like this overemphasis on, on childhood when it's like maybe the analysts themselves are in this edible relationship, not with Freud, the actual analyst who they probably haven't read or read much of, but rather this, um, you know, it's a Verneinung of like the symbolic space that Freud would occupy for them 
yeah. and the yeah the the indebtedness to a Freud that never even existed in a strange way. <laughs> yeah. like how they're still like in a strange way rehearsing in a, a unintended satire <laughs> like what psychoanalysis is the psychoanalysis yeah. that we are we that so many therapists so many people in that community are so happy that they've gotten past gotten beyond Freud figured out a few things. He was right about a few things, but he was mostly wrong. Like that yeah, whole thing. He loved so his mother thing. way too much. <laughs> Which is like, you're okay. So you're trying to be Freudian with Freud. It's like, but yeah. the disavowal is strong with these ones. Like, yeah. or even in like TikTok IG reels, it's like when they say at the bottom, uh, Freud was right, but like in the most crude way of like some type of like weird Oedipal drama of like incest. Well, like oh, yeah far, yeah it's like far from what he's talking about not like in the actual fact that incest is complete it's more of like a symbolic type thing of of recognition it's funny yeah because i remember i think it was a episode why theory where mcgowan and angley were talking about how everybody was just like super titillated by the tweet that uh trump tweeted out <laughs> that time about like oh i'm unprecedented you know as like what a slip right <laughs> like he was saying unprecedented but he wrote it unprecedented <laughs> and was like, oh shit and of course yeah like yeah that is the reaction but it's kind of like it was in their defenses of freud episode it's kind of like yeah like how do you deny freud but then like yeah <laughs> try to yeah like get him on that it's like if you're yeah. denying Freud, you don't you, you shouldn't be allowed to enjoy yeah. what you <laughs> everyone loves pointing out slips like they love like but it's like uh, anyway um yeah so, <laughs> it's the fact that i jumped and I, I landed flat on my feet and then at the same time they want to disavow newton or some shit like that <laughs> <laughs> The inventor of gravity. Yeah. People were just floating around before that, man. <laughs> don't even know. Apples were just flying yeah. right up to space. <laughs> uh, the so, yeah, so I saw something stupid about oh, fuck. I can't remember. It was like it was a it was making fun of Newton. It was like motherfucker. Uh, barely discovered gravity after an apple dropped on him meanwhile like hoes were dropping at his door like then and there or something like that <laughs> Did he die a virgin i don't know that's what i heard <laughs> he is the most like uh virginal chad ever yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was into alchemy too <laughs> all right i want i want this chapter to be over but then he yeah. gets to one more thing that's like ah help me andrew um all right hieroglyphics i thought he was about to get into the fame <laughs> the you know the mysteries of the egyptians were mysteries for them too but yeah. we're not yet. no <laughs> we're not in zizek i was nah, thinking nah, nah. we gonna talk about like dale the funky homo sapien with hieroglyphics like <laughs> no 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 far from it far from um, but i think what he's trying to say is the fact that it's like even in some sense like the, the language and transference could act as hieroglyphics of like images even though if the image of man has the word man and it sounds like man like you know in this most like cliche type thing like we should take it at, at like in that sense like in in, in some instances it's like some words of of, of transference can act as literally like a hieroglyphic. They're literally drawing and performing their, their unconscious towards us. But what's interesting here and baffling is that it might mean a man, but might also represent the sound man. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like with the hieroglyphics, it's like it may mean man, but all of a sudden like it, the word also sounds like man in some shape or form. Or it may have a rhyming word to it. So, but it's like as if it could be like an ideogram, or it could be, um, I don't know, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. That's exactly. Yeah. 
so you don't know what you're dealing with in that sense it's and Freud refers to it to the Rosetta Stone. Right. The Rosetta Stone. And then we talk about like something called like interlineation, which is like, it's like what, like a contract of like speech or some shit like that. Interlineation is like, yeah, that's what I, at least I thought it was. Essential relations with no discourse. Okay. And express adequately. Okay, okay, okay. We're bringing it full circle. Now we get to class. Yeah, so, like the thing of like interlineation, it. It, it, what it seems like for the transference, because like I just looked it up, it's like an assertion of a new language in between the lines of a pre existing legal document. So, it's like if you have a contract with somebody, you could create new rules as long as they exist between the lines like as long as that they could be implied like oh okay i agree to that because that does make sense why you would imply this in this legal contract in the sense there's like this interlineation of language in in, in the way that the symbol transfers between the analyst and the analyzan so far as the interpretation seems to kind of mean something for the analyst or the analyzan even if the analyst seems to like spawn something that doesn't make sense at first, like as an interpretation. And, and, and it's weird because he does bring up like Maimonides, like the mystic, well, he's an Aristotelian, but at the same time he has this weird mystical relationship with, uh, you know, the God of the Hebrews. But wait a second, before we get to that, I just want to say this, because this, this echoes something he says, in an earlier chapter, it's the one I forget the name of it. The one where he introduces between O and O, where it's oh, like, like the, the seesaw of desire. Yeah, the seesaw of desire. That that's where we get uh, a similar statement, which is like that which within the analysis, which he cannot get recognition for. Um, and and that would be the form of his desire. And I guess it's interesting to me that he ends this chapter on the note of um, acting out. And that, like, when I think of a hieroglyphic, it could be a kind of performance. Like, it looks, it could be in the shape of a specific action. And the acting out is, like, almost the attempt to... Uh, communicate a mm -hmm. desire through various means of, yeah. of signification various symbol like whatever symbols are at your disposal in that moment in a sense but it's like do you see what i'm getting at i'm trying no, I'm, no, 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 I'm yeah. look at myself right now i'm trying to <laughs> there's no meta language it's all good <laughs> yeah yeah the the ineffable <laughs> I, i'm just i'm trying to animate in my mind like what's going on here <laughs> i mean like it's funny that it brings up maimonides but then at the same time it's like out of, like out of all the mystics that he brings up it's like he's the most vague about maimonides <laughs> it's just like what's the fucking point of bringing him up <laughs> like I know he's, he's like, like, to, like this weird, this weird cringe, like, oh, like he's a Hebrew, but he's like arguing like if he's an atheist, but then it's like, no, he's got this mystical tone to it. It's like <laughs> I feel like Lacan is just flexing. <laughs> Wasn't Maimonides friends with like Leibniz or something? Were they contemporaries? I think no, Maimonides came around way before Leibniz. Maimonides was like somebody like in like the like 1200s, 1300s. Really? Yeah. I it up. In the in the Middle East. Okay. Yeah. I'm thinking of Moses Mendelssohn. No, but yeah, no, you're thinking of Mendelssohn. That's exactly who, yeah. Mendelssohn. He was Carlos still around, Malabranch. He was friends with Descartes or? Uh, I don't think necessarily Descartes. I think he had some like letters with Malebranche though. Malebranche was somebody who was very much uh, close to Descartes, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
damn come through with the knowledge. Yeah, Nico Nikolai Malabron. He he was another like I guess he's quoted as a Cartesian. Uh right, right. Yeah. One of the not so minor figures of yeah. Cartesian. Weird, yeah. You know, no, it's like I'd love to do a whole history of not only like that time of Cartesianism, but like even like Renaissance Platonists and philosophers. Oh hell yeah. Yeah. To read uh, Radical Enlightenment. Oh yeah. you haven't, but I think the name of the author is Israel, something Israel. Really good book, mostly about Spinoza. Ooh. But uh anyway, um yeah, so like Maimonides, he has this esoteric work where he can he says what must not be said by means of a certain disorder, certain ruptures, yeah, discordances. This is what analytic discourse is like. Which is funny that he calls it an esoteric work because it's really just philosophy. <laughs> Because that's what I was saying, like, he's arguing, like, with Aristotelian logic <laughs> of, like, law of exclusive middle and, like, what counts oh, as okay. the substance. Like, it's funny. <laughs> and he's not categorized as, like, a philosopher. He's categorized as a mystic for some reason. Like, if you go to Barnes & Nobles, you'll see him in the Hebrew section. You won't see him in philosophy. And it's this work. It's the Guide for the Easily Perplexed. <laughs> Is there a Hebrew section of Barnes and Noble? Yeah, like Jewish Hebrew section. Oh, not my Barnes and Noble. I just see like a bunch of Tony Robbins books. Fuck, uh, that's a that's a whack ass Barnes and Noble thing. It's the only only one in town. It's really sad. That, that's sad. I live in a major city. Uh, so all right. Okay, okay, this, okay. This is this is what we were just talking about a desire which is unconscious impossible to express nonetheless finds a means of expression through the alphabet yeah they residues like because they residues this is what he was saying and this is something that uh i guess freud would talk about in dream interpretation which is that like a you don't know i guess if a certain day residue within a dream can be seen as something like a hieroglyph yeah. or like a rebus or if certain elements of it should be taken at face value, I guess. It's like, you don't know, like, cause the, you're unconscious through the stock pile of images and symbols in the pre-conscious is making use of whatever is at its disposal to communicate yeah. something to you in the dumbest way possible. <laughs> in a sense, it's like the most awkward and like, uh ham ham fisted kind of way just trying to <laughs> something to you with like whatever but like it's it's, it's kind of pathetic almost <laughs> and it's sort of the same thing as happening with transference right yeah you know what he's saying it's like okay this this is actually clearing things up because mm -hmm. i haven't ever thought about it in these terms it's exactly what he's talking about in transference though yeah so the the alphabet the, the phonematics of day residues alphabets of desire son <laughs> crazy like so even the things that might have happened to you that day become somehow um color your yeah little did they know that i was transferring That's... like when i was eating alphabet soup from campbell's yes exactly yeah. doesn't mf doom have a song called like alphabet soup or something like that uh, I know most MF Doom songs, but I've never heard that. I don't know that MF Doom and he Black has a line about Alphabet Soup. Man. Yeah, I think so. But that MF Doom and, and Black Dot song you sent me that shit was fire. <laughs> yeah, I want to listen to that whole album <laughs> with Danger Mouse. Yeah, Danger Mouse. <laughs> I haven't uh heard from that guy in a while. <laughs> Well, he's been up to since day. This was a very right. intense chapter, though. All right, let's just finish out this last thing, which is like acting out. Yeah, the, the acting uh, out. We already covered that, kind of. But... Yeah, the acting out is always something that is in relation to pretty much to just to keep it simple. It's in relation to the, an, an, the analytic session, and it's the acting out of the unconscious, but it is always in speech. Acting out is a speech. 
act is speech. And that's what he will leave us on today because he won't elaborate that. But it is to gain recognition, I guess. Act is speech. Yeah. Gain my desire. Yeah. And that is what you act out in the presence of the analyst as if to say, tell me what it is I want. Yes. See what yes. it is I desire. I don't know, but I can show you. And then you yeah. do all these weird, all this weird shit. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why, but also that's why transference also exists outside of analysis because you do that with with people you love, people you hate, with you do the same kind of thing in not in more subtle ways. It's just you you get it back yeah. with other people. And then you're and then there's this whole fucking dance. But <laughs> the idea is like with the in a good analysis, you're kind of doing what you do in everyday life to a degree, but if you're met with silence and you just keep going to mm -hmm. the cr to the cringiest yeah. level of it possible until like <laughs> you have nothing left, I guess. Um, and I, speaking of nothing left, if we're done, son. <laughs> I will leave you on this note today.